Hello and welcome to episode 257 of Retro Encounter, RPG Fans Weekly Podcast of Many Topics. I'm Mike Solosi, and um, we are going to have a podcast today to accompany an ongoing feature with an RPG fan. But before we go into details, let's introduce the rest of the panel, starting with John O'Logan. Hey, hello, everybody. And Alana Hags. Hey, everyone. And Zach Wilkerson. Hi, everybody. Now, uh, Zach, excuse my uh, use of multiple uh, conjunctions there, but uh, this ongoing feature, you were its architect. The feature is called the best RPG of each year, or maybe we're going to title it something fancy for when it publishes. And uh, at the time of posting this podcast, it will be in one or two parts, uh, posting you know over the first half of October. Uh, but let's talk about the feature a little bit and what it is, and then we'll and then we can talk about how the podcast ties into it. Uh, so basically, the idea was, and it was pitched some time ago, and we kind of picked it up. Was the idea was to pick the uh, best RPG of every year since the year that uh, Dragon Quest was originally released. It's not the first RPG, or even necessarily the first console RPG, but it's sort of the RPG that solidified um, what the genre became. Um, and so we went through with a staff vote um, and some internal discussions to decide on the best RPG and then also a runner up for each each year since, you know, 1987 on. Um, we also uh, pulled in readers as well. And it's um, I've looked back and I think from a pure text perspective in a single feature, it might be the largest feature we've ever run. So um, I'm excited for it. Yeah, that's uh, I guess 66 entries over three or four parts is how we're publishing the feature. So, like, I mean, that's 66 me- medium-length paragraphs. That's a lot of text. I, I-, I wrote uh, four small entries for that, and uh, John and Alana, I think you also contributed p- um, parts to the piece. Is that correct? Yeah, a couple. Yeah, I did eight of them. Yeah. I think all of you wrote more than I did, actually, so, Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but you still have the harder job. <laughs> yeah, so you figure like 70 chunks or paragraphs written by at least 15 to 20 RPG fan staff people. It's a, it, it's a, it's a beast of a feature and it deserves a podcast accompaniment. So we have this, uh, when we were doing research for the feature and doing the staff vote for the feature, we compiled just lists and lists of the RPGs uh, of each year and that sort of got Zach and I thinking, hmm, maybe we could each pick a favorite year or even, like, rank the best years of RPGs. And that's what this podcast is. We, uh, the four of us, um, myself, Alana, Jono, Zach, ba- made individual top ten lists of these, of our favorite years of RPGs, and then using a, a simplified scoring system, made a ranked list of ten, uh, the ten best years for RPGs, and we were going to go down the list and sort of discuss each year. But before we do that, uh, th- there were no rules that we had, like, or, or, or no specific guidelines to, like, uh, make sure to follow these criteria when you rank your years. Like, nothing like that. Just sort of a follow your heart, pick your favorite. But let's talk about our approaches a little bit. Uh, Alana, what what thoughts were going through your head when you were sort of compiling your individual list? Uh, a lot. Um, I, I guess I just tried to whittle it down to stuff that I'd played a lot of games, like, years I'd played a lot of games from, and then... I try to weigh objectivity and subjectivity a little bit because generally I don't really play many Western RPGs. I don't play tons of visual novels. Um, so I had to kind of take everybody's um, considerations into account, but ultimately gave like the overall, my overall bias more weight because at the end of the day, it's my personal top 10 list and my opinion is right in my head. So that's why I want everybody else to like, like see my, see how I interpret this list and, yeah, I mean, like, the feature was a hell of a thing to vote on, and I had more, I had, I found it easy to vote on the feature more than I did to put this list together. This was so hard to put together for me. Like, you could whittle it down to ten, and then, or you could try and whittle it down to ten. That took ages. And then putting them into an order was even worse. Like, it was just crazy, but, yeah, it's like a mix of my opinions and what I think everybody else thinks really good, but I'm most important. <laughs> I, I had the same, approach as you uh where i i mostly just sort of went with maybe i I waited a favorite game more than a game i just liked but i also considered games i didn't play like uh i'm trying to just think of a quick example like i I have never played a dark souls game but for the years that had dark souls and demon souls i'm like huh that game is legendary and you know started its own genre i should at least give give that year 
points in consideration, even though I'm not a Dark Souls guy. But but ultimately, my list reflected my tastes and preferences. But I, you know, I still considered games I hadn't played to a degree. Uh, Jono, what was your approach when you were um, compiling your own list? Uh, well, I looked at the list that we compiled, and then I literally just kind of went through it and crossed out anything I could dismiss out of hand just to try to get it down to a manageable number. But that left me with still most of the years left. Um, and then I would, I just went through and kind of painfully picked out years that, you know, had some of my favorite games in it, but it might have been like one game in the year and just kept hitting at it until I, I narrowed it down to the 10. Uh, generally, I kind of looked at my own personal opinion, my connection to that year, uh, critical favorites, so games that I have never played, but I recognize are considered some of the best games ever played. And I also, added a little bit of historical significance to it, like years that changed the face of RPGs and changed the face of gaming um, as very, very important years in RPGs. So I kind of tried to balance those three things. Right on. And I, I again, I don't mean to piggyback on you a little bit, but I also sort of made a first cut that ended up being, I think, 16 years. And then the second, and, and I did that pretty quickly, but then getting that 16 down to 10 was the real struggle, which where I was similar to Alana. It was just... Uh, it, it was really harder to do that than it was to do the initial vote on the feature, especially because I'm, I'm basically considering 16 options that had 10 games each, say, rather than just picking one among 10 uh, 33 times in a row. It's it, 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 <laughs> like, they, they were two different exercises, doing the vote in September and then making this uh, – uh, like and then preparing for this podcast. Uh, Zach, what, like, uh, I guess for both compiling the feature and – preparing for this podcast, what thoughts and ideas struck you as you were making your own list? Um, so a couple things that I'm not sure I mentioned earlier, um, we're using Japanese release dates for this, which I think is important to note. Um, yes. Because some of them will seem strange. Um, we, are, like, we are using original release dates. Yeah. So like, uh, so when the game first yeah. released in any region, which means Japanese release dates for JRPGs and North American or European release dates mm-hmm. for Western RPGs. But that, that throw, that throws everyone off a little bit. Like, um, I had, uh, Dragon Quest 11 got knocked back to 2017, which was a factor for me. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Um, and you know, we only used, um, original releases in most cases. Um, when we were originally compiling the list, there were one or two exceptions to that, but in general, there were not too many. So for example, like Persona 4, could only appear in i think it's 2008 Mm -hmm. is that right yeah um and not 2012 which i believe was the year that golden was released um and and so that certainly had a factor but i will admit that in some cases when i was voting uh both on the original feature and then also on this one um if there was a remake that was significant and maybe definitive that probably factored in my mind a little bit in terms of the quality of that maybe it shouldn't have but it did Um, but you know, the other thing that struck me as I was voting, um, on this particular, uh, podcast, um, list was that I really value quality over quantity. There were some years that just had like maybe 10 RPGs that I thought were all really good, but ultimately the ones that I voted higher were the ones that had like two or three or four that I thought were amazing. Um, and you know, as, as we go through and talk about it, uh, you know, you'll see that reflected in my, in my votes. Yeah, same thing for me. I think I mentioned before, I thought of games either that uh, I liked I, versus I loved versus maybe I didn't play but seem really important. And, and like those, are the th- I, I sort of tried to count those for every year. And sometimes I went with, I, I ranked higher a year that had just a zillion games I liked versus a year that had one or two I loved. Sometimes it was the opposite. It was I really each of us went with our instinct and followed our heart. These are completely, I mean, I mean, Alana, you, you said you tried to balance the subjective and objective. These lists are subjective. <laughs> yeah, of course. Like I just mean generally, I think Jono put it better in that the historical significance to, you know, mm-hmm, like dark right. souls or I don't know off the top of my head, what's an influential RPG or something like anything like that, like chrono trigger, you know, something like that is immediately going to get like 10 points compared to, I don't know, like something else. Yeah. Chrono Cross? Well, <laughs> Chrono Cross is more inventive, so, yeah. Ironically, one of the Chrono games does have its year appear, and the other doesn't. So we'll see exactly how we get there. Well, that's the thing. That's the thing I noticed, is that going through the entire list, there are no losers on this list. Like, oh, no. even, year, even years that weren't fantastic for video games, there are still games that are like regularly show up on uh, top 50, top 10 lists. 
Yeah, and and also there will be probably some surprising absences. Like uh, listeners might be listening for their favorite RPG to be mentioned over the course of five hours or however long this podcast takes, <laughs> and uh, and and um, it, they might not get it because that uh, game, even if it's excellent, was in an unlucky year. Uh, and also, I should mention our choices were uh, were pretty consistent. Uh, there are thirty three years in this feature, eighty seven to twenty nineteen, and. Uh, we only had 15 total years between all four of us. So, like, a potential 40 entries, there was enormous amounts of overlap. And uh, when one of those years was only voted by one person in the 10th place spot. So, sort of knocking, cutting that one out, we have, we're, we have 14 years that were, you know, significant to our lists. So, 14 out of 33, that's a low number. We, the, um, the four of us overlapped a lot, and there's some level of consensus. So, it's it's not, I don't think any of us is deeply hurt that one year finished too high or too low. Although, I mean, I don't want to say that we all had near identical lists. That's not true at all. But uh, but there was overlap, and we sort of settled on 14. So really, I mean, the t- the title of this podcast is Top 10 Years for RPGs. That's a blatant lie. We're talking about 14 years. <laughs> Uh, but uh, we've talked too much about the list without actually listing things, so let's just go right down to it. Uh, first, we'll do these four honorable mention years, um, and we'll do those four in chronological order, and then once we get to ten, we'll have proper uh, ranked list order. So uh, let's start with 1992. Um, the Some of the significant RPGs in 1992, Speed Reading Time, Dragon Quest V, Final Fantasy V, Luna the Silver Star, Romancing Saga, Soul Blazer, Ultima Seven, and Shin Megami Tensei One. Uh, Zach, what, what do we think about 1992? I mean... 1992 definitely got a vote for me, um, and it, again, it goes back to that quality versus quantity thing. So you've got two RPGs here that are just like all-time classics for me. Dragon Quest V, which is still, in my opinion, as you and I have discussed, Solosi, my favorite Dragon Quest game. Um, and sure, in the original version, it's not as good um, as maybe the remake is, because you've got three-person parties instead of four. <laughs> That's um, the biggest change. <laughs> Yeah, it's like the only real major change. Other than that, it's like it's a great game, and st- the story's still intact from from both. Um, but yeah, Dragon Quest V is an incredible game. It's one of my favorite stories in RPGs, and another one of my favorite stories in RPGs is Lunar the Silver Star. Two very romantic RPGs. Yeah, that's true. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's funny because um, there was some disagreement about, uh, I'll, I'll just say it sort of internally, I don't know where we'll be on the feature about where these two should place on our other feature. Um, and for me, Lunar is such an important, romantic, nostalgic, like sort of innocent game that like captures like a particular feeling that I don't think other RPGs have done, not even Eternal Blue, um, of just like uh, adventure. And like it, and it has such great characters um, that for me, it's like those are two really really amazing rpgs i final fantasy 5 of course is amazing but those two were really the ones that got a got this a vote for me yeah the 90s feature very strongly on our top 10 but 1992 uh slipped through the cracks a little bit and did not finish within that top 10 uh, let's move on to the second honorable mention we're going to try to go through these fast that's 2008 um some of the good rpgs in 2008 castlevania orbular order of ecclesia disgaea 3 fallout 3 last remnant lost odyssey monster hunter freedom unite persona 4 tales of vesperia valkyria chronicles knights in the nightmare um I, this was on my list and i don't think it was on anyone else's uh largely because i've I think so highly of Persona 4, Tales of Asperia, and uh, Castlevania Order of Ecclesia, and I'm still haunted by the Metro system in Fallout 3. The, 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 those are, the, those are the, the big standouts to me. But um, it, it didn't make the list, I, I think, just because there are so many other strong years. There, no, no two ways about it. But uh, for me personally, just having my favorite Persona game and my favorite Tales game made it uh, it sort of inflated its value a little bit. And, oh, geez, I guess this also was... Uh, I, I factored in the nostalgia of my um, Monster Hunter obsession that started in the late 2000s on the PSP. Uh, Freedom Unite is Freedom Two and Freedom Unite were the two games that that turned me into a Monster Hunter monster. <laughs> and uh, like Valkyria Chronicles is obviously great. Uh, we have two of the best 360 RPGs here. Uh, Disgaea Three, not my favorite Disgaea, but still definitely 60 hours of my time uh, in the late 2000s. It, it, I thought 2008 was an unusually strong year, but it was Persona Four and Tales of Vesperia that swung it for me. I think you're right. I mean, the Castlevania games on both the GBA and the DS are amazing. Hell of a run in the 2000s, Aww. Castlevania had. Mm. I remember playing them uh, in one month, all of them in one month. I was doing a, <laughs> I was doing I was doing a Halloween show at. 
Canada's Wonderland, and I would just, it was a huge, it was a super long commute, so I just plowed through all of them. That's so good, uh, though. I, I was yeah. I, I was a big Symphony of the Night fan in the late '90s, early 2000s because, of course, I was. And I don't remember exactly when I jumped in on the train, but uh, I, I think I think Circle of the Moon and Harmony of Distance were already out. Uh, but like, I started on those Castlevania games in the GBA, and then I basically played each one as they came out in the 2000s, and just had an absolute blast and and it solidified Castlevania as one of my favorite series and Order of Ecclesia is one of the best ones Shinoa is a great main character mm-hmm. agreed alright well I think that's enough about 2008 uh, let's move on to our third honorable mention that's 2011 which features among others Bastion, Dark Souls, Deus Ex Human Revolution Disgaea 4, Elder Scrolls 5, Skyrim, Blast Story Nino Kuni, Tales of Zillia, To the Moon, The Witcher 2 uh, Jono let's talk about 2011 a little bit yeah, for me, this was one of those historical years that changed a lot of things, but there are actually a few games on this list that I have uh, played a ton of. I mean, for example, uh, let me, uh, Bastion was the very first super giant game, and uh, it really set their stage as like an amazing developer. And I mean, right now, Hades is out, and I believe Alana is losing her mind over it. Well, I am losing my mind over it. It's incredible. But let's leave that for another day. Yeah. Uh, Dark Souls came out. I mean, it's considered to be by many to be one of the greatest games ever made. Um, like you said, it's legendary. Uh, Deus Ex Human Revolution rebooted the Deus Ex series, and the original is considered, again, to be one of the greatest RPGs ever made. Um, the Last Story, I think we talked about this on a prior podcast, Losi, uh, was yeah, a... The, yeah, The Last Story was a retro encounter game from, oh, 2015 or 2016. Yeah, and it was a key part of Operation Rainfall for yep. the Wii. Mm-hmm. Uh, for Xenoblade Chronicles, uh, Last Story, Pandora's, and Panda- Pandora's, Pandora's Tower, Tower. Yeah. yeah. One of those three games has made a considerably bigger impression than the other two, but... <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. Yeah, To the Moon is, you know, it, it took the it took a classic RPG graphic style and applied it to a incredibly intimate story uh that had no combat or anything like that uh but the real reason it's not the real reason that i have 2011 on this list is because of uh, elder uh, elder school skyrim uh i mean it's i i can't say this for sure but i can't think of any other any other game that's been released on as many consoles as this thing the joke i used to tell about a game being released for everything was final fantasy 4 because yeah. I because it would come out on everything and I would play it on everything and which is why I somehow have played that game I think more than any other Final Fantasy, in in terms of rolling credits. But but now it's Skyrim. Like you could play Skyrim on a VR refrigerator in 2021 probably. You can play it on Amazon Alexa. It, you can. Yeah, it's a it, that's a joke, but it's true. And now I mean, that yeah, it was a, now that Microsoft it, owns Bethesda, I think by the time we get a new version of Windows, you can play Skyrim on Excel. That I think that's going to be the move. That'd be so good, like a old school tabletop RPG or a map or something. Combining my love of spreadsheets with my love of RPG is perfect. <laughs> I mean, and there's mm-hmm. there's no doubt to me that we're going to be playing Skyrim forever. It's going to come out on uh, the it's going to come out on the uh, Series X. It's going to come out on, on PlayStation Five inevitably. It's just going to be there forever, and I don't really have a problem with that because it's an amazing game. Yeah, I've only played Skyrim once, but. That's a hell of a game. <laughs> yeah, and I, thanks thanks to modding, there's going to be there's going to be quality content made for that game for years and years to come. No disagreement here. Um, like Skyrim looms large in 2011, but that game had, that excuse me that year had a lot of great games. And let's move on to our final year uh, year of honorable mentions. That's 2015, which includes um, well, there's Bloodborne, Blade of the Second, Fallout 4, Final Fantasy 14, Heavensward, Undertale, Tokyo Mirage Sessions, The Witcher 3, Xenoblade Chronicles X, and Yakuza Zero. So Alana, 2015, a lot of favorites here. A lot of favorites and pretty varied as well. I mean, like off the back of Skyrim, I would say Witcher 3 is probably pretty widely regarded as one of the best Western RPGs ever yeah. like it's an incredible feat of storytelling of structure of characterization of side quests and yeah i would say that the two dlc packs of the witcher 3 are two of the best dlc expansions ever and i think yeah it's just i mean people cd project red have gone from this really tiny studio to like the behemoths that they are now like i mean they're kind of they're kind of under the radar they went under the radar for years and now they're kind of under the microscope in every single thing they do now is kind of like watched with beady eyes um Undertale is probably my favorite game of the decade. Like, it is such a... It's just incredible the amount of stuff they pack into, like, a six-hour indie title. And this was kind of, like, along with a couple of other early 2000, 2010 RPGs and games, this was kind of the birth of, like, the single-person RPG, like, made by one person 
not entirely like they're all assets assets and stuff like that were made by somebody else but yeah there's nothing else like undertale final fantasy 14 heaven's ward i mean i mean that like people say a realm reborn was amazing and it was but i think heaven's ward is where the um mmo really came into its own and it's so incredible such an incredible story and actually like showed people that you could tell an incredible story in an mmo and then you've got things like uh bloodborne which is kind of competing with dark souls the original for the best blood like souls born game ever and it's the only one i've gotten more than a couple of hours through because i really love the gameplay of that one um but yeah like my experience outside of that like i haven't played bravely second fallout 4 is not always considered the best but a solid continuation tokyo mirage sessions which we covered on the podcast this year is kind of an under the radar classic that so many people love yakuza zero which we also covered on the podcast yeah and big retro encounter Zen- year 2015 yeah <laughs> yeah and xenoblade cross which is kind of having a bit of a bit of a renaissance recently with people discovering that it's not actually too bad and i'd like to give that a second shot i mean this game actually finished pretty high on my list personally just because undertale has got to be the best indie rpg of all time heaven's ward i I know everyone gives Shadowbringers like a lot of love and it deserves it. But I think in terms of story, I still slightly prefer Heaven's Word. It's, it's incredible. Um, mm-hmm. Bloodborne is the only Souls, Souls board game I've managed to get more than an hour into. Um, and I'm so <laughs> bad that like more than an hour means like an hour and a half. Um, but even I could see the art direction and the style was amazing. But The Witcher 3 is an incredible accomplishment in storytelling. Uh, I know that we tend to lean JRPG as a site, um, but man, The Witcher 3 is its out of this world. I don't really love our Western RPGs, but the quality of its side quests alone, it's unparalleled. Um, yeah, I, I think th- this is the only one where I'm like, oh, I kind of wish it was higher because it's, it's, it's a great year. <laughs> There's going to be one uh, Western RPG that I talk about a lot in one, in a future entry, but um, I'm, I'm not a Witcher guy, but the, uh, the how huge it was in 2015 is undeniable. Um, I had so much fun discovering TMS and Yakuza 0 this year for the podcast. Those are two games I was interested in but not, but not rabid for, but then quite thrilled with finally played them after finishing either of them. And I don't think it's an accident. Um, Stormblood and Shadowbringers are made in Heaven's Word's image. Like, everything from the release schedule to how they position the different dungeons and quests are really following the pattern that Heaven's Word made and not the pattern that Realm Reborn made. Realm Reborn made a lot of mistakes and have a lot of awkwardness in, in the, in the quest design and storytelling, but then you can tell that the other expansions are building off how good Heaven's Word was. That's, it's not an accident. Um, but, uh, I mean, still, it, I, th- I think Shadowbringers is my is my favorite FF14 expansion, but Heaven's Word is excellent. And I mean, Bravely Second, that's a full one third of the RPGs I've reviewed for the website. So of course, I have affection for it. <laughs> it is it's a good review too. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, I like Bravely Default and Bravely Second a lot. And um, I, I thought about 2015 for my list. Like it and one other game that uh, ranks higher were sort of my eleventh place vote getters. But the uh, but ultimately, I did not vote for it. But it, it got enough votes to at least uh, carry an honorable mention. But let's move on to the list itself. Otherwise, we will be here all night, and we uh, I think we all have work tomorrow. <laughs> so <laughs> we're not recording this on a Friday, folks. Uh, let's move on to the list proper, which, again, was a ranked list based on each of us submitting an individual top ten. So we, we will probably mention things like, oh, uh, th- where was this on your list, Zach? Or so, um, things of that nature. Starting with spot number ten. The year is 2004. A couple of big games in 2004 are Dragon Quest VIII, Fire Emblem, Sacred Stones, Legend of Heroes, Trails in the Sky, Trails in the Sky First Chapter, Paper Mario, The Thousand Year Door, Phoenix Rides, Attorney, Trials and Tribulations, Pokemon, Emerald, Shadow Hearts Covenant, SMP Digital Devil Saga, Vampire the Masquerade, World of Warcraft. Uh, this ranked very highly for me. Um, only two of us voted for it, but it's in huge part because of Dragon Quest VIII, Paper Mario, A Thousand Year Door, my favorite Phoenix Wright game, the third one, Shadow Hearts Covenant, and Digital Devil Saga. Those are five games I love like like yeah. love 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 yeah and i think as well like you can't understate world of warcraft yeah. at all in this yes. year and i think that's maybe why it snuck on I, I i haven't played it but world of warcraft is still going in 2020 so it's got to be you know that's got to mean something and dragon quest 8 is like 
the first Dragon Quest game that really made a big splash in the West. Like, it was the first one we got in Europe, and I remember freaking out over it, because I was like, oh my god, finally a Dragon Quest game, and I loved every single second of it. Um... Yeah, for similar reasons to you, I also voted for it. Um, I placed it ninth, um, so not too high, mostly because, like, I think some other Dragon Quests have kind of prevailed over it, like 5 and 11. Um, but Thousand Year Door, Trails in the Sky first chapter, Shadow Hearts Covenant, which is personal choice. Um, yeah, it's a great year. And again, the best Phoenix Wright game, which I will totally agree with you on. Yeah, I'm on the same page yeah. about that, too. It's so mm. good. It, it's mm. really good. Like, uh, uh, um, uh, I think all of the Phoenix Wright games are are at least good but trials and tribulations felt like such a culmination of the previous two and just delivered the drama so enormously especially in the last two cases it, it's I, I think it's still the best one over a decade later and we should mention trial this is the japanese gba release date <laughs> for trials and tribulations yes. uh, it, it came out i think four or five years later on the ds worldwide but uh, the first three Phoenix Wright games started out on the GBA. And, um, I mean, Digital Devil Saga is, I, is I think, my favorite Atlas game that isn't named Persona. I, uh, I, that game's excellent. Um, and World of Warcraft, I was a huge fan of World of Warcraft 2 and 3. Um, and never played World of Warcraft, in part because I was afraid of what it might do to me. I, um, but I, I actually followed the story of World of Warcraft by reading things like news articles and wikis, just because I wanted to see, you know, what happened to characters like Jaina and Arthas. Um, so I, I have a some level of weird investment into World of Warcraft, even though I have never played it. And uh, and and like uh, Alana said, it's so hugely influential and successful that you kind of can't ignore it on a list like this. Yeah, although everyone, I think most people on RPG Fan would consider Final Fantasy XIV to be their MMORPG of choice. Yeah, but me too. Historically, World of Warcraft, like I lost a full summer to that game. Uh, <laughs> it, it just ate. I don't. I don't even remember that summer. It just ate all my time, and eventually, I just got annoyed that I couldn't do instances by myself because I was such a single player gamer. Yeah, I, I just kind of stopped playing it. Eventually, it just I just let my subscription run out, and I haven't played it since. But every now and then, I look at it. There's a there's an upcoming expansion, and I look and I think, hmm. I know yeah. friends that lost years to World of Warcraft, and there's even, uh, and this person is not my friend, but a very popular commentator in the fi- fighting game community actually was so addicted to World of Warcraft, he had to temporarily retire and unretire, and he, and even went into something like a rehab program for um, weaning himself of the, of of that game, God. which is which is crazy to think about. But uh, like, aside from its addictive qualities, it it is. Um, so many games are trying to get a piece of that MMO pie because of World of Warcraft. It wasn't the first MMO, but it was the first one that had really a global level of super success, I feel. Well, joint with Final Fantasy XI, I think. But World of Warcraft definitely had the wider scope, maybe, at the time. Because a lot of people were still like, oh, Final Fantasy is a single-player RPG, and then... Eleven comes along and throws all that out the window, and, kind of thing. And well, you can get if you want to get weird, you can talk about things like RuneScape or EverQuest, which which, oh, yeah. which predate World of Warcraft. I don't think any of them had the uh, had the numbers, the global impact of WoW. That you really can't deny it. No, and I mean Blizzard, no, I Blizzard had the experience too with Diablo, and they trans they, mm-hmm. a lot of the stuff they took from Diablo and put straight mm-hmm. into World of Warcraft, and it translated really, really well. The fourth campaign in uh, Warcraft 3 Frozen Throne is kind of a single-player-ish segment of Warcraft 3. And, I, and like World of Warcraft, I think they even said that uh, creating a game more like that is sort of... Like, that was almost like a World of Warcraft Zero. It, it, they had been sort of the toying... Yeah, they had been toying around with like a loot RPG like Diablo in a Warcraft setting for way longer than just the difference between 2002 and 2004 but uh was that the one was that the uh, dlc with thrall uh um well yeah the expansion is frozen throne and the thrall chapter of frozen throne is is what i'm referring to yes yeah that i had a great time playing that Mm -hmm. warcraft 3 is such a great game oh i love warcraft 3 it's a um uh, but this is not a WoW podcast or a Warcraft 3 podcast. We should move on to the next year. <laughs> so finishing ninth in our top 10 years for RPGs is 2010. So some of the um, great games in 2010, Danganronpa 1, Fallout New Vegas, Ghost Trick, Kingdom Hearts, Birth by Sleep, Mass Effect 2, Nier, Auto- uh, no, 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 sorry, the first Nier, <laughs> Pokemon Black and White, Radiant Historia, Residence of Eight, Space Funerals, Xenoblade Chronicles, and Etrian Odyssey 3. Um, I-, I did vote for this game, uh, and... The the biggest mover and shaker is Xenoblade Chronicles. I think that's really one of the best RPGs of the past twenty years. 
Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's got some depth to it, too. I mean, Xenoblade Chronicles, for me, is the clear-cut winner. I mean, it's just the way that it blends, in some ways, and I guess I've just sort of thought of this, like, it, it blends MMO concepts onto a single-player RPG, which is sort of the opposite of what fourteen is doing, where it pulls some great single-player concepts in. Um, but it, just the scope of its world, the exploration, um, the... the it's so much simpler than previous Xeno stories, but it's still an incredible story. Uh, but you know, other, you know, um, other games in this year like Near, Near has its jank, but Near is a phenomenal story. Um, mm-hmm. Like it's got a great, great, great story. Mass Effect Two, which again, I know we're, we're we tend to slant a little Japanese here in terms of JRPGs, but Mass Effect Two is generally regarded as one of the best games of that generation, maybe the best game of that generation. Mass um, Effect Two is awesome. Yeah, it, I mean, yeah, it's I, uh, got great fan. shooting mechanics. Um, it feels less RPG than the first one, but it is definitely a superior game. <laughs> and Birth by Sleep has got the best Kingdom Hearts story as well. Yeah. I personally, I mean, uh, there's a lot of games in this year I haven't played, but Fallout New Vegas is one of my favorite games of all time. Um, and, and what's really remarkable of, about Fallout New Vegas to me is uh, how they how they had to rush it. Contractually, they had to rush it. And just how much even bigger that game would have been if they even had an extra couple of months of development time. But as is, it's I think it's still one of the most popular follow games out there. Yeah, um looking at this this list at a personal level, uh Xenoblade Chronicles, Dungeonapa One and Ghost Trick are all games that have appeared on Retro Encounter. Uh I'm a huge fan of uh Mass Effect two. It like and I and I was I played Mass Effect one and two late, but it was Mass Effect two that sort of made me so hype for the twenty twelve Mass Effect three year. Uh, and I, which I played on launch. Um, uh, Pokemon Black and White, uh, Gen 5 is my favorite Pokemon generation, so I have a lot of affection for that one. Yeah, I, I haven't played Birth by Sleep or Nier, but I sort of want to, and, and knowing how well-loved those games are probably was a factor in me uh, voting for this on my list. 2010 is a really strong year. Yeah, I agree. I mean, and also, I I had a really, really great time uh, talking about Ghost Trick with you on uh, two episodes of uh, Retro a while back. Yeah, um, a little bit less than a year ago. I think that that was uh, that was late 2019. Yeah, that was fun. And uh, we did the Xenoblade episode. I think was 2016. Oh man, it's a thousand years ago. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that Radiant Astoria deserves a mention as well. I mean, I think that the way that it deals with tra- time travel mechanics is probably the second best RPG for time travel mechanics. The other <laughs> one might appear later. Um, but I love the battle system of that game. The story is strong. The characters are good. Um, in terms of mobile RPGs, it feels really rich and dense. Well, I mean, mobile RPGs. It's a, I mean, uh, well, mobile versus handheld can be a bit of a loaded, a loaded term. It, it, it's a, it's a DS RPG, but an yeah. extremely excellent one. Great Yoko Shimomura soundtrack, also. Yeah. Ooh, what's what's a better Yoko soundtrack, Alana? Um, Birth by Sleep or Radiant Historia? Oh, Radiant Historia. Oh, okay. And Radiant Historia is even better than Dinner Blade Chronicles. It's like her oh, my. <laughs> to that. Well, it is because she doesn't do all the music to Dinner Blade Chronicles. Dinner yeah, Chronicles yeah. is like seven. Yeah. Was like I'm not seven counting people. Ace Plus's mm-hmm. stuff because yeah. Ace Plus's stuff on Dinner Blade Chronicles is the standout, isn't it? Yep. Like, yeah. Um, I'm the only person who didn't vote for 2010, I should probably say. Um, I feel a bit bad. It was one of the ones I was juggling around with 2015 and 1993, I think. Um, I, I couldn't put an, I couldn't justify it. I love Xenoblade Chronicles. Again, probably second favorite RPG of the decade. And I love Nier and I love Pokemon Black and White. It's my second favorite gen. I love Danganronpa. Birth by Sleep is like my second favorite Kingdom Hearts game and Fallout New Vegas. I acknowledge is one of the best Fallout games, but uh, I don't know why it didn't make my list. It was one of those ones that I have kind of had to cut sadly and was very disappointed with myself now looking at this it, it, it did make my list but um this one was sort of quantity uh was a factor like i i mean i yeah. I, I love mass effect 2 and xenoblade chronicles but aside from those there was also like six or seven games on the list that i either liked or acknowledged as being great so th- th- this one it was it finished on my list but sort of low on my list beca- but it was a some Quality, a lot of quantity. It was a twenty ten is a strong year. All, all, everything in the top ten is a strong year. We're we're getting weird. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a kind of it's a kind of year that everyone really really likes, but it's no one's favorite. Yeah, I think so. All right, and uh, this next year is a little bit different from twenty ten. Only two people put it on their list, but it was a uh, but it was medium to high on both lists, which is how it uh, scored so highly. The year is twenty twelve, and a couple of the big games in twenty twelve are. Bravely Default, John Ganonapa 2, Diablo 3, Fire Emblem Awakening, Mass Effect 3, Pokemon Black 2 and White 2, Torchlight 2, East Memories of Celsetta, The Walking Dead, Telltale, Zero Escape, Virtue's Last Reward. 
Uh, I won't beat around the bush. This I, this game finished fourth on my list. It finished super high because literally every single game on that list is that, that I just mentioned is a game I played and either really liked or really loved. I mean, I mean, like these are all Solosi games, all of them. Uh, <laughs> they all. It, it's it, it's a weird coincidence how that happened, uh, but. Uh, I, I can either, for every game in that 2012 list, I can either rank it among my all-time favorites or remember a time when I played it and how that was just a really great three or four weeks being obsessed with that game for a while. Uh, there, there's a number of retro encounter games here. Danganronpa 2, Diablo 3, uh, and Virtual Last Reward all, all had dedicated episodes. And, um... Yeah, like, like I, I had a run of playing a bunch of Telltale games, and that started with The Walking Dead. Uh, when I was playing every East game back to back in the 2013-14 range, uh, Memories of Silsetta was included in there. Uh, I, I, Mass Effect Three is not my favorite Mass Effect game or Bioware game, but I was, I had a lot of fun playing that in like release week and being the part of the hype for that. Fire Emblem Awakening is probably my second or third favorite Fire Emblem game, and rekindled my interest in the series after I was pretty disenchanted with the DS ones. Um, Danganronpa 2 is my favorite Danganronpa game. Zero, uh, Virtual Last Reward is the, is my favorite uh, Uchikoshi game. I adore Bravely Default. Jono, maybe we should podcast about it sometime. Yeah, I'd love uh, to. And, but weirdly, the game that maybe looms the largest for me personally in this whole list is Diablo 3. Because for maybe longer than two years, uh, I'm, I'm not sure exactly how long, that was my comfort game. It, I would go home put on a podcast or an album and just play a bunch of Diablo 3. And it does not have a great story. Um, and I, I uninstalled it from my PC after Blizzard were a bunch of jerks in 2019. Hmm. Uh, but that is a game that I have so much affection for, for everything for its, from its class design to its dungeon design to its loot, uh, it, it, its, uh, its loot hunt to the arcade nature of adjusting difficulty and playing exactly to your preference and, and level of intensity. I, 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 I miss Diablo three be for having it uninstalled from my PC for about a year. And, and that's a weird thing to say. Um, like Diablo three is one of my favorite games of the 2010s. And it was a huge factor in putting this, uh, 2012 in my top four. Well, it finished exactly fourth. I'm not going to be around the bush. Yeah, the, the year, for me, I, I adore this year too. It ended up as uh, seventh on my list, and I'm I'm pretty much there with you on Diablo three. This was this was during a golden age where Blizzard could do absolutely no wrong in terms of what they were making. Uh, it's just such an incredible run of games that they were churning out over and over again. I do remember the I do remember the launch uh, controversy of Diablo oh, yeah. three though. Oh, that yeah. was a nightmare. It was one of. It, um, if it wasn't for Final Fantasy XIV, <laughs> Diablo III would be the best reclamation project of the past ten years. <laughs> yeah, but that's the um, thing. What they did with it after that is kind of remarkable. I didn't start playing it until after it, uh, after the expansion where it sort of became its own thing. But that transformation is just sort of part of the Diablo III story that makes it so impressive. Yeah, and I mean for me, I remember, pl- I remember downloading Diablo III and playing it. Uh, and I, I liked it. I didn't love it. And I found that Torchlight 2 for me was a really nice antidote to it for that year. I, I think Torchlight 2 is a great game. It's it's a great sequel to the original, really built on everything that was presented in Torchlight. Um, I understand that it's a shame that they didn't do the same thing with Torchlight 3, but I guess we'll see when its full release comes out in a few weeks. Yeah, um, Torchlight 3 has had a troubled um, alpha period or and beta testing period, you could say. I, I'm not sure what to think about Torchlight 3. Yeah, wasn't it supposed uh, to be a Torchlight Online or something like that? It was originally going to be an MMO, and then they sort of scaled that back and said it was going to be kind of like an MMO. And now they're saying, no, it's its own thing, but de- but it's, you can definitely play it online. And it has been – your response has been mixed to the uh, – to the um, beta period for Torchlight 3. But um, sticking to Torchlight 2, I think Tor- Torchlight 1 was sort of an improved Diablo 1, and Torchlight 2 is an improved Diablo 2, uh, which is not surprising since, like, the Schaefer brothers and a few others uh, of whom the original Diablo team are were part of Runic Games that made Torchlight 1 and 2. And, like, I don't think I ever need to play Diablo 2 again unless I really want to, you know, make another Concentrate Barbarian or something mm. because, Dor- because Torchlight 2 does Diablo 2 so much better. But Diablo 3 is its own thing, especially with, like, the the instance nature of dungeons and uh, how the loot hunt and, uh, and like... Uh, and sort of character building with really weird twists like uh, like Kanai's Cube, letting you delete armor pieces so their ghosts can stay on you, sort of. 
uh, like like Diablo three is its own incredibly fascinating flow of a of a loot RPG or or a class based action RPG. That, and, and and with Diablo 2 and Diablo 3, I'm sorry, with Torchlight 2 and Diablo 3 in the same year, I can sort of have both versions of Diablo that I really like uh, playing. But And I still have, I, I did not delete Torchlight 2 from my PC, and I've played that as recently as earlier this month. Mm. I'll tell you something else, else about uh, Diablo 3. Uh, mm. It still looks real pretty. That game has such a beautiful design. Yeah. Its graphic style is just even if it was released today, I think some people would be like, "Oh, it could be better." But it, it I think the artists that were working on it, whew, they did a remarkable job. Yeah, uh, Blizzard sort of famously tries to design their games to be able to run on as many machines as possible, which is why uh, World of Warcraft did not look stunningly beautiful in, 20, in 2004. But uh, but but like so, it's designed for access and for clarity, and I think because of that, you can play Diablo three on any laptop nowadays, and it still looks at least pretty good. Yeah, I mean, and finally, a bravely default for me. I agree with you. I love mm. it. Uh, it revitalized the classic Final Fantasy style of RPG, right down to using the crystals. And I know that you and I differ uh, about our opinions of the end of the game. Personally, I loved sure. it. It really played to my uh, my love of alternate realities and stuff like that. But, Who said I didn't love it? Oh, I thought that we had an argument about that one time. Oh no, 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 no! I mean, you could have argued about a bunch of people about that, but not not me. I think I think bravely defaults. It's it's penchant for repetition. It's sort of designed to annoy you as it's happening, but then they justify it with uh with sort of the the concept that they're trying to introduce for the finale. It's a uh, I I I um I accept the uh the penchant for repetition in bravely default and bravely second. Okay, yeah, we're on the same page then. I get why people don't <laughs> like it, but I love it. I, I heard you argue with Nathan about it on an episode of Random. Maybe that's what you're talking about. Maybe I argued with. But, a few but talking about, about alternate it. dimensions and time, time travel, uh, Zach says Radiant Historia is the second best time travel RPG. Yeah, I disagree. Now you say that, I it think. might be Zero Escape versus Last Reward. <laughs> yeah, VLRs. I, oh, man, um, I actually think I like Nine 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 a little bit better, but um, the 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 scope of Virtue's Last Reward and the quality of the puzzles along with that, um, and the characters and just. I, I I had no idea what was happening in that game throughout until the end, and just it all locks into place in a really amazing way. Um, it follows through on what nine 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 does well, really like at least for most of its runtime, really well. Um, I don't think the twist at the end is quite as impactful, and maybe part of that is that I don't think that the third one follows up on its premise as effectively as I would hope. But it's still just an incredible, incredible VN adventure puzzle game. Totally agree, and we are in danger of falling behind, so we got to move on. Uh, finishing seventh in our list of the top ten, our, uh, top ten years for RPGs is 2006, which uh, again, similar to last year, only two people voted for it, but it was they were two very high votes. Um, and among the best games in 2006 are Batman Kaidos Origins, Disgaea 2, Elder Scrolls 4, Oblivion, Final Fantasy 12, Kingdom Hearts 2, Legend of Heroes: Tears in the Sky, Second Chapter, The Legend of Zelda: Twilight Princess, Mother 3, Okami, Pearl, Pokemon Diamond and Pearl, Persona 3, Suikoden 5, Valkyrie Profile 2, Xeno Sega Episode 3, and East Origin. So uh, it finished in the top four for both Zach and Alana. So Alana, let's talk about 2006 a bit. Um, so this was a bit of like, I mean, this was one of the most difficult years to vote for, I think, personally. Um, I remember when we were doing like internal votes and people were like picking their favorite RPG from that year. And this was probably the year that came up the most. Like you've got Kingdom Hearts 2, which is arguably the best Kingdom Hearts game. Trails of the Sky second chapter is arguably the best Kiseki game. Mother 3 is amazing. Okami is maybe the better Zelda game out of the two Zelda games that came out that year. Um, Persona 3 is where Persona really modernized and became this whole, you know, multi-life, you know, you've got your school life and your dungeon crawling life. It really changed that series. You've got the last week at mainline week in game, I should say. Um, Ease Origin is hugely popular and one of the best Ease games in the franchise. And Oblivion, which again is another really fantastic Western RPG. Um, personally, like, I think I put Mother 3 as my favorite just because Jesus Christ, what a <laughs> game. And I mean, you can hear about that from a few months ago. Another retro episode there. Um, mm -hmm. cameo. Um, but yeah, like, this was just like a sheer mix of like there's quality and quantity mm -hmm. like there's so much that i love but probably more that i like which is you know it's why it came in my top five like it was four and 
yeah, like even games that I don't love, like Disgaea and Oblivion, personally, um, I don't love Akami or Twilight Princess either. Um, and I've never played Valkyrie Profile Two and Xenosaga, but there's ch- and Sweet and Five either. But um, yeah, like this is like if you put that list in front of anybody, like I'm actually surprised that not everybody voted for this year. I'm genuinely quite surprised, but. I suppose, Solosi, I know why you didn't vote for it with Kingdom Hearts 2 there, so. Yeah, as much as I, as much as I love Okami and Persona 3, Kingdom Hearts is sort of like, takes away one of those votes. It's like, like cancels but it you out. You voted for Birth by Sleep Year, so you've got no excuse. <laughs> no, I, 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 I really don't. Um, I mentioned that there was a couple years that sort of finished 11th that I considered for the 9 or 10 spots. It, really, it was 2006 and 2015 were those years. Um, I, I, uh, I really like, Twilight Princess, Final Fantasy XII, Pokemon Diamond yeah. Pearl, and I love, love, love Okami, Persona 3, and Mother 3. Uh, but I, I, there were just more games I loved in the years that finished in the 7, 8, 9, 10 range for me. Again, this was, this was one of the last years I cut on my personal list, but I don't want to take anything away from it. It's a, it's, um, it, it's a really excellent year. This, I mean, for me, this is the deepest year probably on the list. And there are games that I love on this list. I and mean, I love Final Fantasy XII. I love Mother 3. I love Suikoden 5. Um, and there are games that I like. Uh, like, um, I, mean, I, like I, mean, I really love Kingdom Hearts 2, I'm going to be honest. Kingdom Hearts 2 is a great game. Um, but there are other <laughs> games that have reputations that I haven't played that I desperately want to play. Like Xenosaga Xeno Episode 3, if I can ever find an affordable copy. Um, <laughs> Okami. Persona 3 is like the, uh, the Persona game that is still like my gap game. Um, but in Kaidos, I mean, like there is so much happening this year. There is a, such a depth to it, but you know, with the, it, it's also kind of top heavy. I mean, like mother three is, oh man, that's a game. Um, <laughs> that is a game and sweet in five. <laughs> it's not sweet in two, but damn, it's a great game. Um, it, it's a really, really deep year. I think it's interesting that this is also a transition year because uh, Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion is probably the first great Xbox 360 RPG. And yeah. um, a lot of these games like Disgaea 2, Okami, Persona 3 are late era PS2 games. Like, like this is Yeah, uh, Twilight Princess was a dual console release as well. Yeah. GameCube and Wii. Yeah, I remember the, um, the map was flipped uh, because, the, because they had to make Link uh, right-handed for the Wii version. Hmm. Yeah, I had the oh, Wii yeah. version. The first right-handed Link. Yeah, and I but I played it on GameCube, but the um, the, I don't remember the sort of like the version of the game my uh, the package that my game came with had the Wii version of the map, so uh, it, everything was everything. Uh, so I, my GameCube game and the Wii map had everything flipped. <laughs> <laughs> so the uh like like west oh, west and east was flipped on the map basically so it was, it was kind of amazing that the that that even happened but yeah but this so we have a lot of late era ps2 and gba games or maybe only mother 3 for gba and i'll end a couple early generation uh ps we 60 era that, that that makes 2006 sort of an interesting transition year that just i think especially had just a lot of strong ps2 and gamecube games on it yeah, there are like I'm looking at the list, and there are some amazing games here. The only reason it didn't appear on my list is uh, 2006s. I think everyone has like a dark age year or a couple of dark age years where I was in my second year of music theater school. I didn't have time. I wasn't in my apartment for more than like four hours at a time that year, and that was for sleep. So I just didn't play games that year at all. So I recognize everything on the list, and I recognize it as great, but I don't really have any personal opinions about any of the games on it. Right, yeah, this is probably the year I really, really, really started to get into RPGs personally, like the late 2000s. I was getting into them in the 2000s anyway, but like 2006 was like high school, like trying to find friends who played them as well. And it was really the time where I started to it's like, well, this is what I love and this is what I'm going to do. This is yeah. what I'm going to stick with and run with it. I think I was still playing PS1 games in 2006, but I... I, I so was yeah. I, yeah. <laughs> I, I played a lot of these games late. But still just I- evaluating each of these games sort of ha- how much I love them in 2020, it, it was strong but not, a- but not the highest finisher. But also I haven't played Xenosaga 3, Suikoden 5, Kingdom Hearts 2, Oblivion, a lot of these uh, really good games. Mm. And also I-, I, personally, I personally find it that uh, Mother 3 not getting released year after year, it's just getting funnier and funnier at this point. <laughs> It just. Nin- well, I've already played it, so I can I can wait. Now yeah. it's oh, I know, but I, I feel like it's got to be a joke, like deep within Nintendo, that they're every they just think it's the funniest thing in the world that they do not really re-release Mother Three in English. So twenty twenty six will be the twentieth anniversary, so we'll get it then. 
Speaking of Mother 3, this is a pretty heavy retro encounter year. We got uh, Mother 3 Okami, Persona 3, Suikoden 5, Final Fantasy 12. Uh, oh, and there is an episode on Trails in the Sky SC from years and years ago. So yeah, this is a, a pretty pretty good uh, retro encounter year. Mm. I guess the last thing I'll say about it is that what I find most impressive about it is this was also like a dark age of RPGs for me. And that I've come back to like a huge majority of these. And I the ones I haven't come back to, I need to come back to. Which is what makes it maybe even stronger mm-hmm. in my mind. But the next year was not yeah. a dark age of RPGs for me. Oh, no. no. Uh, we're, we, are, we are at the sixth place right now in our top ten list. And there's going to be a lot of 90s in the top six, let me tell you. After living in the uh, 21st century for the first uh, for the first four in the top ten. So sixth place finishing year is 1994. All four of us voted for this. And I should mention the top six. All four of us voted for all of the top six, which is where the, those uh, commonalities in our list uh, start becoming very obvious. But some of the great games in – excuse me – some of the great games in 1994 include Breath of Fire 2, Beyond Oasis, Earthbound, Final Fantasy VI, Lancaster 2, Live Alive, Lunar Eternal Blue, Robotrex, Shining Force CD, Shin Megami Tensei 2. And I'm just going to open up right away. I've played four of these games, which are Breath of Fire 2, and then three certified all-time bangers, Earthbound, Final Fantasy VI, and Lunar Eternal, Lunar 2, Eternal Blue. Those last three are why I put this around the middle of my top ten list. It's... it's uh, one game I like and three games I love, love, love. Uh, that was enough to just pencil it in immediately and never have it leave the top ten. I mean, I, I agree with you. Those three are all all timers. Uh, voting for this year was hard for me in our feature. The Breath of Fire Two is also my favorite Breath of Fire game. It was like my first Kill God JRPG because um, <laughs> it had finally gotten <laughs> through the censors. I think <laughs> um, and the demons of the church II, all along. Yeah, I, I still have a lot of affection for that game as a result. Um, but yeah, I mean. Lunar Eternal Blue, I, I might prefer one, but oh man, and then obviously the other two speak for themselves. I mean, and Rubber Trek is kind of a fun game, actually. It's a little underrated. Honestly, if Final <laughs> Fantasy VI was the only game oh. released that year, it would still argue, 1994 would still arguably be on this list. <laughs> oh yeah, definitely. I mean, like, yeah, like Final Fantasy VI and Earthbound are the reason it got on my list, because I haven't played Lunar yet, but... Uh, what do you do if, you know, if you were to recommend some RPGs for someone to play on the Super Nintendo, aren't they, like, two of the first three you would recommend somebody, surely? Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, um, I, 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 they were part of Square's incredible run from 94 to 96 that still haunts my dreams, where they came out with, like, Final Fantasy VI, Second like, Insetsu Three, Chrono Trigger, and Mario RPG, like, in the same 18 months or something, and, uh, and er- yeah. Earthbound... I would say Earthbound and maybe Dragon Quest V are the best non-square RPGs on the SNES. Maybe, I don't know, maybe there's some Lufia 2 fans out there that are uh, that are banging down my door with a hatchet. But it's because I'm surprised. Do you like Lufia 2 as well? I like Lufia 2 a lot. Like yeah, Lufia it turns 2 out 2 I love the surprised. SNES RPGs yeah. oeuvre a lot. <laughs> but the uh, but yeah, Final Fantasy Final Fantasy VI and Earthbound are two of the signature signature Super Nintendo RPGs beyond a shadow of a doubt. And and uh, oh yeah, they. Both of them have been on the podcast. Uh, so has Lunar Two, a- and uh, yeah, like, anyone interested in that era? Those are two of the first few you you uh, recommend. You're absolutely right, Alana. Right, yeah, and they're so different as well. Like Earthbound is like I know Earthbound's regarded for its humor and its writing and things like that, and at the time it wasn't really highly regarded because you know silly marketing campaigns and whatever. But it's so <laughs> interesting and it's so it's so forward thinking and so modern, like well written and so. I just I don't know it's just great I just loved every second of it and Final Fantasy 6 like how on earth do you balance 14 characters as well as that game does like obviously there's some that don't get enough attention and others that just come in at the end but Jesus I think Final Fantasy 6 still makes a case for having one of the best Final Fantasy stories of all time just because of how well balanced that main cast are and how politically charged it was for the year it came out in as well like it's such an important and shocking game to play. Like, if you don't know what's going to happen going into it, like, that halfway point is really going to kind of kick you in the face and take you by surprise. And it, 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 personally, it does a lot of things right for me, like, on an emotional level and a personal level. So, yeah, it's super, super important. And Live Alive is really unusual as well. Like, I've never played it. I was about it, to say that, yeah. But, like, it's got such an unusual structure to it. Like, this feels like a really experimental year in a way as well. Like, you've got Earthbound's strange sense of humor, you've got Final Fantasy VI's massive cast, and then you've got Live Alive, which I think is seven different stories and different characters and different time periods, and you have to play through them all and then get this true ending. It's just a really interesting year for being, 
you know, kind of going towards the end of the Super Nintendo's life. It's not quite there, but we're in the like comfortable stages of it, I think. Yeah, I I mean, even the games that are on this on this particular list that aren't like Final Fantasy VI or Earthbound, Beyond Oasis is an absolutely terrific uh, RPG, yeah. I guess action RPG. It's super fun. I love playing it. Uh, Robo Trek again. It's it's certainly nothing that knocks the ball out of the park, but it's a fun fun game to play. Uh, Live Alive, I, I, if, I mean, rumor has it Live Alive might be coming out uh, in in. Uh, this region yeah, there there was a, there was a well, no, there was a yeah. trademark applied for yeah. in uh, regions outside Japan which has a lot of people excited uh, about that um Langrisser 2 had i think Langrisser had some recent mobile versions that uh re-sparked interest in them and Langrisser 2 is a uh, pioneering strategy RPG that probably mm-hmm. be- belongs in the same breath as the Super Nintendo Fire Emblem games and maybe Tactics Ogre and uh and Shin Megami Tensei 2 is uh the the SMT fans that go way back uh, talk about the sort of conflict between law and order in that game a lot as being uh, really impressive, and uh, I think it's more well regarded than SMT One, but but I haven't played it. No, I haven't either, but I know it's really popular. Yeah. I do want to play Lunar as well. It makes me so sad I can't talk about it at the moment. So um, I will be. Unlike Zach, I prefer Lunar Two to Lunar One. I, I think it's just yeah. a stunningly great RPG. I, I oh, had I, so much fun playing that. For I agree with the second well. part of that statement. <laughs> I'm on the same page as you, <laughs> Like that's the thing. I don't think anyone here would argue that Lunar One is a bad game. No, no. It's brilliant, but I think Lunar Two just the story touched me a heck of a lot more. The love story in Lunar Two specifically really hit me where I live. Yeah. Uh, the story that hit me in Lunar 2 is, um, uh, is, is the, uh, mysterious masked swordsman character that joins you, <laughs> uh, who, who most definitely yes. doesn't, doesn't re- resemble great. anyone else. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I have no idea who that <laughs> guy is. I, I mean, it's been 16 is. years and they still haven't told us who the masked guy is. It's crazy. <laughs> mm. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, also, also Lunar, it's a part of our legacy for RPG fan. So, mm-hmm. exactly. gotta mention yeah. that. The former LunarNet.com. Yeah. But, Exactly. Anyway, we don't want to become the uh, former podcast known as a Retro Encounter and have this, you know, ha- have this three-hour monster end my career as a podcaster. So we're going to move on <laughs> to the fifth place here. We're living in the '90s again with 1997, and among the great games of 1997, a co- uh, uh, including a few you've probably heard of, are Alundra, Breath of Fire 3, Castlevania Symphony of the Night, Fallout, Final Fantasy 7, Final Fantasy Tactics, Grandia, Mega Man Legends, Saga Frontier, Shining Force 3, Tales of Destiny. So remarkably, you have. Uh, my least favorite Tales game that I've played, and my favorite Final Fantasy game that I've played. <laughs> but there's a... Oh, I didn't know 7 was your favorite. No, Tactics is. <laughs> oh, Tactics. Right, sorry. <laughs> oh, my God. I adore Final Fantasy Tactics. It's what, it's what introduced me to uh, strategy RPGs and eventually kindled interest in Fire Emblem and Disgaea, among others. Uh, I, the story is amazing. Delita is one of the all-time great RPG characters, in my opinion. Um, the, the gameplay is super satisfying once you sort of get over the hump of what the F is going on, JP, squares, direction, I don't know. Uh, it, it also, uh, Castlevania Symphony of the Night, not my first Castlevania game, I played a lot of the SNES and SNES ones, but uh, playing this, uh, went like Castlevania went from, oh, th- those were a couple pretty good rentals uh, 20 years ago, or 10 years ago, into, oh my god, I need to play every Castlevania game now, this is... Unbelievable. Yeah, this changed my world, Symphony of the Night. I love this game to death. And Mm. it's like somebody at Konami was like, oh, Super Metroid's a great game. Why don't we put RPG elements into it? And they created a monster and a whole genre out of it, really. Like, how many Symphony of the Night clones have there been since? Like, hundreds enough. You know. I mean, mean, just within Castlevania, there's got to be seven or eight. I'd have to check a list. But without Symphony of the Night, we don't get Shadow Complex or Time Spinner or a bunch of other really, really excellent games. Um, Like, and in terms of influence, Final Fantasy VII. I mean, my God, uh, this was the first RPG for so many people uh, on their PlayStations in the late 90s. Uh, and Alana, correct me if I'm wrong, isn't that the first Final Fantasy game that came out in Europe? It was the first official Final Fantasy game we got in Europe, wow. yeah. I hate That's it. Awful. I don't hate the game, I hate that. I hate that that was the first one we got. We figured. <laughs> and uh, um, it, it indirectly also gave us um, probably one of 2020's best RPGs. Am I allowed to say that? Uh, the FF7, FF7's FF uh, legacy has been so huge from it, like how good it was on, on its own to the compilation of Final Fantasy VII games in the 21st century to the FF7 remake in 2020. 
just the 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 legacy and reach of that game is just astounding. Mm. Yeah. Um, something I noticed I want to point out is like, this is kind of a year where we've got like, you know, we're moving on to the 3D generation of consoles, but we've still got this mix of like sprite based art as well as like 3D art as well. And I think it's really cool. Like Grandia uses a bit of both. Symphony of the Night is entirely in 2D and then you've got things like Final Fantasy 7 and Mega Man Legends, which use this kind of like polygonal art style. And it's a really cool mix. It's like, it's a really cool way to see like, these kind of games evolve i think alana you me, oh, no, oh, you, go ahead. You, no you go ahead jano go i mean i my, this was much higher on my list than uh where you guys put it um it, I, I had it a second and i think the reason for me why i had it a second is i arguably 1997 is one of it's probably in my opinion it might be the most important year in rpg history. I think that 1997 is the year that everything changed for RPG in terms of how they were perceived by the public, their popularity. Um, and yes, a lot of that is due to Final Fantasy VII. Like Final Fantasy VI, you know, it's a, it, everyone likes it, but it never, it never uh, exploded on the SNES. Final Fantasy VII uh, blew the top off the place. Uh, Symphony of the Night, I mean, it created its entire genre. Like you said, Metroidvania. Tactics completely revitalized and uh, revolutionized the RPG strategy game. Um, Fallout, same thing with uh, turn-based, uh, turn-based uh, storytelling and things like that on the PC. It's just a year that changed everything. Um, and because of that, it's the reason why it's so high up on my list. I think historically speaking, it's hard to beat. I mean, I agree with that. I guess for me, and I, I think I put it the lowest of any of us. I think I put it eighth. Um, I mean, Final Fantasy Tactics is really the reason that it still got my vote. And if I hadn't played Symphony of the Night in the last, I don't know, year i don't think i would have voted for it and it's because maybe it's just this is again personal preference like i don't disagree with you i think 97 is the most important year but like final fantasy 7 while it's still a good game like the og one like it doesn't it doesn't hold up the way that it used to i'm not being a hater by any means i think it's still a great game um but i would still take a lot of final fantasy games over it um and, and you know it, it, i guess for me like i'm looking at the games as they are and i think there are two great games this year and then there are two other games that have not aged very well and there are some other games that i just don't think are actually very good um like lundra is very frustrating psycho frontier (laughs) is also very frustrating although it's got amazing art um so uh, i guess for me that's why i put it where i did I have a feeling I know who put Alundra and Saga Frontier on this list, but uh, we we don't need to name names. Um, I can't believe I just missed out a chance on to on bashing Saga games. I can't believe I missed that. <laughs> you missed one earlier as yeah, well. Yeah, Saga <laughs> reference earlier, right? Yeah. Oh, don't worry, my favorite's coming up soon. Um, <laughs> in terms of retro encounter, uh, we got some here: um, Castlevania Symphony of the Night, FF Tactics, Grandia, Mega Man Legends. I sort of wasn't that impressed with Mega Man Legends when I finally uh, played through it for the first time um, about a, a year ago. Maybe, maybe it was two years ago. I don't. I, I've lost track of what it's years. Twenty eighteen. Yeah, it, it was October twenty eighteen. So right around two. Yeah, right at two years ago. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, Alana, how much uh, you were talking about how uh, a lot of these games blend two D and three D? How about that? Those uh, Capcom late nineties sprite animations in Breath of Fire three and four. <sighs> You know how much I love them. I have such a soft spot for 90s sprite work. I'm playing a game at the moment, we're playing on retro, that I'm in love with the sprite work with on the Sega Mm. Genesis. So, Mm. yeah, I'm a big fan of it. I just love sprite work so much. It's so cool. I mean, there are other years that have got, you know, indie games that use sprite work and things like that. But there's something really, really special about this kind of blend of art styles that the console, like, the console revolution was going through, you know, like, where where's the balance kind of thing? And the PS2 kind of moves into 3D more, but then you start getting the indie developers to go, th- like, go off with that kind of style thing. So, yeah, it's so cool. Now, for the next game on our list, uh, finishing in fourth place, we're only moving w- ahead one year, so there's still plenty of great sprite work to talk about, Alana. Uh, 1998 finishes fourth in our list of the ten best years of RPGs. All four of us voted for it. And some of the great games in 1998 include Baldur's Gate, Brigandine, Dragon Quest Monsters, Fallout 2, Grim Fandango, Legend of Zelda, Ocarina of Time, Panzer Dragoon Saga, Parasite Eve, Pokemon Yellow, Star Ocean 2, Suikoden 2, and Xenogears. Uh, Suikoden 2 and Xenogears. You want to talk about some beautiful sprite work. <laughs> Oh my goodness gracious. Well, Xenogi is less, but yeah. Well, Sweden 2 has got like, the blue like, rat I, and the bone dragon. Like, I think that the player characters have really cool, smooth martial arts movements in Xeno, in, in, Z, in Xeno Gears, yeah. But the, but the sprites in Sweden 2, especially for the bosses and for the 100, uh, for the 
80 or so uh, playable characters that you recruit. Uh, I know it's 108 total, but like some of them are, you know, blacksmiths or shopkeepers that, that don't fight. Uh, the, the, the sprite work and animations is like chef's kiss late 90s video games. <laughs> Star Ocean 2's got some cool stuff. Yeah, it does. Oh, mm-hmm. yeah. yeah. The action, the action great... uh, sequences in that are cool because of the sprite work, too. Yeah. And you want to talk about some 3D effects, uh, like Ocarina of Time, maybe uh, even more so than a Mario 64, like made me believe in Nintendo 3D, mm-hmm. seeing that for the first All time. Right. It's not my favorite Zelda game. It's probably not even a top five Zelda game for me, but it might be one of the most important video games Nintendo has ever produced. I think 100%. it made me believe in 3D, period, actually. Not just for Nintendo, like it, it, everything, every Zelda game and actually every action RPG after Ocarina of Time, they owe it a huge debt. Yeah. I mean, it, I would agree it, with it, its camera is functional in 1998, which is already saying something because there are games with bad cameras in 2020. But it, but the Z targeting in Ocarina of Time feels so influential to me. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. like, like being able to fix on a certain point and have your camera rotate a- around it is something that is in every important 3D game now. Like, like if if you can't if you can't sort of focus strafe or lock on, then whatever game you whatever action 3D game you're playing becomes way more frustrating. Yeah, I, the problem with playing a game like Ocarina of Time now, uh, unless, unless you're playing it on the uh, 3DS, the remake, is it's kind of like. It's kind of like when you see the very first iPod and you're like, it's the size of a deck of cards. It's frigging, you know, heavy and huge. It has a, it has a spinning hard drive in it. Uh, it holds like not a whole lot of songs. You really have to remember that it was how influential it was and how everything that came after it was impacted by it. Um, I think Ocarina of Time, I'm with you on that, by the way. I, I wouldn't be on like my top five Zelda games, but in terms of what it did for the Zelda franchise, uh, it's probably one of the most important Zelda games. Yeah, I mean, I'm going to sound like yeah. a hypocrite here, but um, that was one of the reasons I voted for this year <laughs> was because of the significance of Ocarina of Time. Um, but obviously, Suikoden 2 and Xenogears are amazing to me because they have two of the greatest RPG stories of all time, but they do it in such yeah. vastly different ways. Um, that, like, I think that's amazing. Like, Suikoden 2 has a very... Um, you know, easy to understand storyline, but it has great characters um, with like lots of different complex motivations, but you can follow it. Xenogears, the first time I played it, I was like, what? I have no idea what's happening here. <laughs> uh, but I played, I played it again after a couple years later and I was like, all right, all right, I, I understand what's happening here. But like Parasite Eve is also really influential in terms of like yeah. blending action mm-hmm. and RPG elements in a really fascinating way in shooting elements. Like Mass Effect doesn't exist without Parasite Eve probably. Yeah. And, and shooting and horror elements too. Yeah. It's right. Yeah, Parasite Eve did not deserve its squares. Uh, squares Resident Evil, I think, was what a lot of people were calling it back then. Parasite Eve yeah, Two, though. Parasite Eve Two yeah. kind of is Squares Resident Evil. It is. Yeah. I mean, Parasite Eve as well was technically a tech demo for Final Fantasy VIII. So mm-hmm. yeah, but it's so cool. It's cooler than Final Fantasy VIII as well. And I wanna, I wanna give a shout out to Grim Fandango as well because yeah. like. I know we played it for retro and I find it really frustrating, but I do think it's one of the best written and funniest games I've ever played in my life. And I still think about it today. And also Panzer Dragoon Saga is like the kind of, the, 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 you know, the rare gem that everybody always wants to play. And I was rewatching some videos on it because I played it as a kid and don't remember too much about it. And Jesus Christ, the stuff they get out of the Sega Saturn on that game is incredible. It's like, I don't know. It's like watching aerial flights in like, I don't know, some prototype flight simulator from like the nineties or some like sit. It's, it's really a feat. It's incredible. It's my white whale at this point. I mean, if I could, if I could play that game, <laughs> it's a hell of oh, a white man. whale to have. <laughs> oh man. It's, it's never going to happen. It, but I want it's to. one of mine also, uh, it, mostly because of the lack of access to that game. Yeah. Uh, but now that Sega's pretty excited about, uh, remaking their old stuff, I'm, I hope Panzer Dragoon Saga is on their list along with another game we're going to talk about very soon. Um, but uh, st- sticking in 1998, uh, Grim Fandango, I, I, I think I would love that game more if all of it was as good as Act 2. Because a- a- hmm. Act 2 puts you in this amazing noir city setting uh, where you're going... Yeah, it's, just this- like, it's a Casablanca pastiche. Yeah, it, where, where, it, yeah. where uh, I, mean, I mean, Manny Calavera in the iconic white suit. Like, I, I think that uh, it, it's such a cool noir uh, Day of the Dead idea that sort of peaks a little too soon. Like, I, I, I remember just being so excited to start Act 3 and then struggling to finish it <laughs> when I was uh, for the yeah. podcast in time. And speaking of the podcast, yeah. uh, Grim Fandango... 
Parasite Eve, Suikoden 2, and Xenogears have all had Retro Encounter episodes. Uh, a lot of good contenders for future episodes here. Uh, I, I know Star Ocean 2 is, has been on our list for uh, years, at least. Um, hmm. thra- and Dragon Quest Monsters, it, it's not exactly the Pokemon killer that maybe Enix wanted it to be. Uh, but that game is still kind of great, and it's a spinoff of Dragon Quest VI, which is wild to me, uh, at the, which I did not understand the first time I played that, because I played that game in the early, early 2000s before trying DQ6, and then when I, and then playing DQ6, I was like, oh no, this is the, the, this is the same Terry and Millie, isn't it? Or, I mean, that was back when they couldn't decide if Millie's name was Millie, Muriel, or Millayu, which is a choice. Milieu. Yeah, some of the, some early translations uh, of the very literal. Uh, yeah, of the Super Nintendo version are a very, very literal Milieu. I I don't know exactly what they were going for, but they've settled on Millie in remakes of uh, Dragon Quest VI, which is fine by me. Makes sense. Yeah. Um, Can I ask you guys? I I'm just curious. This was before I joined the site because God knows I would have been on the panel if I if if uh, I was on staff at this time. Do you guys play the remaster of Grim Fandango or the original? Remaster. The remaster. Mm-hmm. Okay, I'm just curious. What do you guys make of the uh, the improved controls? I guess you could say. Mm, not great. <laughs> um, yeah, <laughs> they didn't I feel great. I played the original as well, though, and I remember them not being. They're, they're probably better at the time because it was keyboard and mouse. So the tank yeah. controls, yeah. Yeah, I, I yeah. played it on PS4, and there is an achievement, or I should say, a trophy for switching to tank controls in the first room of the game, <laughs> and then and then playing through the whole game with tank controls on. <laughs> And that was apparently something that the developers insisted on putting in. <laughs> yeah. One thing I want to point out about 1998 before we move on is that 1998, when I was doing like some reading around, like, is widely regarded as probably the best year for video games ever, just because of like, I think Tomb Raider and Spyro and a couple of other PlayStation 1 giants came out that year. Metal Gear Solid, I think, came out that year as well. Star- uh, Starcraft came out in 1998. It did, yeah. Mm-hmm. So like, outside of its RPG over, like, it's also considered widely as a really damn fantastic year for games. And the fact that it's so, you know, it's fourth with games like Suikoden and Xenogears and then what we've got to come is, is crazy. All agreed, but let's move on to what we have to come. Uh, finishing in third place, we are only going a couple years ahead, and ha- now we're reaching uh, the games that were finished first and second on a lot of people's lists. Um, finishing third in our list of the top ten best years for RPGs is 2000, and a couple of the great uh, games in 2000, Baldur's Gate 2, Breath of Fire 4, Deus Ex, Diablo 2, Dragon Quest 7, Final Fantasy 9, Grandia 2, Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask, Paper Mario, Persona 2, Eternal Punishment, Fantasy Star Online, Skies of Arcadia, Tales of Eternia, Vagrant Story. Wow. Um, <laughs> uh, this, I, all right, this was my number one year, and... Because it is just full of games I really like and really love. I haven't played all of these. Um, I've, I've never played a Fantasy Star game before a few weeks ago when I started playing Fantasy Star 4 for this podcast, for a future episode of this podcast, but, um, Skies of Arcadia, in my, in my top 10 JRPGs, Diablo 2 was one of my huge obsessions in high school. Uh, I went to high school in the early 2000s. Uh, a couple really good retro encounter games here, like Grant, like, uh, Breath of Fire 4. And Final Fantasy IX, uh, Final Fantasy IX probably in my top three Final Fantasy games. Uh, I, but really, it's just, like, all of these games, uh, I can either say are one of my favorites or hugely important to the, uh, to the genre. Um, like, I, 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 you know, I haven't played Majora's Mask, and that's probably my biggest Zelda, uh, um, missing part of my resume. Yeah, I yeah. have. Yeah, I've played almost every game on this list maybe like Dragon Quest 7 and Baldur's Gate 2 I think are the only two I haven't oh and Eternal Punishment um this is like 2006 on crack for me like you've got my two favorite video games of all time like Skies of Arcadia and Final Fantasy 9 which is my top one Final Fantasy and then you've got like Deus Ex which is extremely innovative for the time um Baldur's Gate 2 is quite possibly that the best crpg going oh yeah diablo 2 as well like diablo 2 held that franchise it wasn't even a franchise at that point 12 years until diablo 3 came along uh you say that diablo 2 had an official update from blizzard via their patching system in 2013 they were updating that game for 
over a decade after it came out, you can still find people playing Diablo 2 on Battle.net today. And it, it was, I, I don't think I ever need to play Diablo 2 ever again, but it was so huge for me that I have a lot of memories associated with it in the early 2000s and, and through college in the later 2000s. Baldur's yeah. Gate 2 was probably the game that made Bioware. Like, mm-hmm. uh, that was the great D&D game for a long time. It's based on the Forgotten Realms uh, story and setting of um, from Dungeons & Dragons, I think, third edition. Uh, D- D&D fans don't come after me. Uh, but uh, all those other hugely influential games that uh, Lana mentioned, I think Dragon Quest VII is a great Dragon Quest game. Uh, Paper Mario is maybe my favorite N64 game, full stop. I think that game's <laughs> awesome. Uh, <It's> so hard. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Agreed, but <laughs> let's not linger on that point a little too long. But um, Skies of Arcadia uh, was I. Uh, it was the game that made me want a Dreamcast. When my when a friend offered to sell me his Dreamcast for twenty five dollars, I thought to myself, "Hmm, he's also offering me his copy of Soul Calibur. That's pretty good." But now I can finally play Skies of Arcadia. Yeah, and but Soul Calibur's good too. <laughs> Soul, Calibur, Soul, Calibur, Soul Calibur's good too. Like I'm, 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 just, I'm not saying Skies of Arcadia is the only reason is is why I mentioned it. But I like playing Skies of Arcadia. I had to track down a copy on my own because he didn't have uh, SOA, but but I knew about the game by re- by reputation. And playing that game in high school felt it, it was the, uh, uh, the it was the only time I've ever owned a Sega system, uh, unless the unless the Genesis Mini counts. Um, but like, felt like uh, me almost crossing enemy lines, like being a Sega kid when I was <laughs> when I was such a, when I was a, a Nintendo kid that switched to being a Sony kid in the '90s, and and playing that for the first time and having it be having it meet or e- exceed every expectation was so special to me. And the, and replaying it on GameCube uh, in at university four or five years later, it's like, it's like, this is the same game, and it's as good as I remember, with, with a few wrinkles, like a few bonuses here and there, and a few uh, um, detractments here and there. I love the idea that for some people, like, their high school rebellion is like smoking a cigarette behind the gym, but for Solosi, <laughs> it's playing a Sega game. <laughs> yeah, that was, I don't remember exactly when it happened. I was a senior in high school, so it was probably 2004. But, uh, like... like Skies of Arcadia is very special to me. Tales of Eternia, one of the yeah. best Tales games. I I think I worry that it's under the radar now because you can't. It's not really easy to uh, to obtain. Um, uh, the, there there was a UK PSP version that I that I ended up playing because one of my, because one of my Tales of Eternia discs died. <laughs> uh, but the. Uh, I, I I worry that's under the radar now because I mean I mean because Tales of Symphonia was so huge to so many people, but I sort of preferred Eternia to Symphonia always. Yeah, and, I did too. And it was the first Tales game that felt like a fighting game with a cut with a really uh, a really robust combo system. It feels like it has the best balance of gameplay and story to that point. Like Symphonia's is awkward 3D with some cool story moments, but Eternia is like pretty simple 90s 2000s story with a really cool 2D plane combat system. Like they'd finally figured it out mm. after two games. Like it feels really great to play. Even now, I would say it's fast. It's really easy to pick up, but it's yeah. not, and, and it's got some challenge to it as well, which I think is great. Yeah, Fantasia was sluggish, and then the yeah. uh, and then. Uh, d- Destiny and the PS1 version of Fantasia were slightly more sluggish somehow, and Eternia was faster than both of those, and had more freedom in spell in like spell customization and combos than the previous ones, and it has the greatest uh, character in Tales history, uh, 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 Max, <laughs> King of the One Liners. I love Max so much. <laughs> yeah. He, he's the okay uh, um for people that haven't played Tales of Eternia Max is the little john of RPG characters he 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 has one word answers to everything and is just so over the top and great i, I <laughs> If we did a, if we did a podcast on Tales of Eternia, I would spend a full five minutes on Max. I love that guy. <laughs> yeah, me too. I think for I mean 2000 has 2000 is arguably the pinnacle of the uh 32/64 bit era. Like, it's the year where it, it reached its peak, because the following year after that, it, we moved into the next generation. Uh, it's kind of like the 1995 of the uh, PlayStation and N64 era. Um, also, there's a, something that really gets me about this year. I, I think I said this earlier, and it, it, it's a – how I tr- – what I consider to be a perfect sequel – is a it's a game it's a game that builds off everything that the original has perfectly to the point where you don't even need to play the original game anymore unless you're wanting to play for its story 
and 2000 has three of those games on it for me. <laughs> Diablo 3, uh, Final Diablo Fantasy 2. 9, mm-hmm. and Majora's Mask. I, I knew you were talking about Diablo 2 when you said that. Uh, yeah. because, because, I mean, after playing Diablo 2, you don't ever need to go back to Diablo 1 unless you want to cross it off a list. It's, uh, <laughs> it, it's, it, it's such a, it's such a startling change. Yeah. And I think it's the same thing with Final Fantasy 9 and Majora's Mask. That's not saying that Final Fantasy 7 and 8 and, uh, Ocarina of Time aren't brilliant and well worth a play. But 9 and Majora's Mask does everything that the game that the games before it did, but better. Um, and for me, that's, it, it's an incredible year. And I mean, it, it, providing we're ignoring the dragon in the corner, which is Dragon Quest Seven. Dragon Quest Seven is good Dragon Quest, but it's also the most Dragon Quest. It's, it's the also problem. better than the 3DS. I, yeah, I, could, it, like, never, uh, I could never get past the first Bloody Island. I just it, couldn't do it. And we're going from the PS1 to the 3DS, you have a 110-hour game that turns into a 60-hour game, which is pretty... Pretty good. That's significant. Um, yes. Yeah. <laughs> right. They fix it. Uh, let's see. I'm trying to go back here. Uh, can, can I get weird about voice actors for one minute? Yeah. Um, yeah. The, the sort of three main characters of Grandia 2. Oh, no, that's the character. Yeah, the, vo- the, vo- the voice actors are Cam Clark, Jennifer Hale, and Jody Benson, who are <laughs> Leonardo from the Ninja Turtles, uh, Fem Shep from Mass Effect, a little bit later than this, and literally the Little Mermaid. That, that's all. All right, <laughs> every throwing time. that out there. You, I, you yeah, I, out every time. Whenever Jody Benson appears in anything, which is like only four things, I have to bring it up. I know that's fine. Grandia Two is cool. Grandia Grandia Two is good. It's you know I think it's my favorite Grandia. I think it is. Not not a large list to draw from. I was gonna say there's not much <laughs> really competition got two between options. one and two. Yeah. I'm a I own a copy of no three, but I haven't, I haven't put hard time into it. I was a little bit sad in Grandia 3 when Miranda left the party. That's why That's why I stopped. Uh, I'm a little surprised that we haven't talked about Vagrant's story anymore. Right? I, yeah, like, that's such a significant... Again, like, Panzer Dragoon Saga before it, it feels like one of the most cinematic, really... The, one of the, it's probably got the best art design of that generation, I would say, out of any game ever. Like, those cutscenes are incredibly good. The camera movement in cutscenes in Vagrant's story yeah. is so good, it, it makes me almost... It makes me wish that the polygonal graphics were a little better, because it's like, these polygons are... Good for 2000, but a little dated now. But if, like, because I played this game last year for the, for the podcast, uh, our, uh, like, if we had this camera with slightly better, uh, uh, better textures on the, on these characters, then it would be still breathtaking. But it, it, if anything, it maybe it, it highlighted the weird polygons in that game. The reason I didn't talk about Vagrant Story yet is because I'm still, oh, it was a struggle, uh, getting, uh, going through yeah. that a year ago for the podcast. I, I procrastinated a little bit too much on it. But it, but it, but it, but it's excellent, and uh, and now Joe definitely counts um, Vagrant Story among their favorites. Of course, because it's like it's Matsuno as well. It's mm-hmm. just brilliant. Yeah, I mean, I definitely did not beat that game on my own at whatever age I played it. Like it was definitely a joint effort between me and my brother and my mum. So <laughs> yeah, it's hard as hell. All right. But now, speaking of things that are hard as hell, choosing between these last couple uh, games on our list was definitely a struggle. Uh, this, uh, this next one finished in everyone's top five, and you will see why, because there, it is full of certifiable bangers. Also a saga game, Jono. Yeah, and then... And the one you also a certifiable well. banger. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, finishing second in uh, Retro Encounters' uh, 10 Best Years for RPGs is 1995. And let's talk about some 1995 games that you might have heard of. Chrono Trigger, Dragon Quest VI, I'm not going to speak fast anymore, sorry. Front Mission, Luffy 2 Rise of the Sinistrals, Romancing Saga 3, Seiken Densetsu 3, Suikoden 1, Tactics Ogre, Let Us Cling Together, Tales of Fantasia, Terra Enigma, and Secret of Evermore. I mean, for me, uh, it finished second on my list because Chrono Trigger... And uh, Seiken Nintetsu 3 and Tales of Fantasia are three of my all-time favorites. And then there's a couple other games on this list I really, really like, like Dragon Quest VI, Tactics Ogre, and Terra Enigma. And you know what? Secret of Evermore is all right. Lufia 2. It is. Oh, Lufia yeah, 2. Yeah, Evermore is. Is. I hate it. Gets... Too. Man, I'm sorry. I, I, I've had an eye problem the past couple of days. <laughs> but, but yeah, like, like, I'm, uh, I'm tripping over my words. A bunch of retro encounter games on that list, including uh, one we played earlier this year in Tactics Ogre. Uh, hugely influential series starters like Tales of Fantasia. Um, 
Oh man, like this is this list is mostly Super Nintendo, but it also might be the best year of Super Nintendo. Holy smoke! Yeah, it's a lot like 2000 in the sense that it's the pinnacle of its generation. Yeah, you've got yeah. PS1 as well because Suikoden is really the one of the first PS1 RPGs. Another one, another one of those transition years like 2000 or 2006. Agreed. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I mean, sort of ignoring the elephant, which is Chrono Trigger. Um, I mean, Suikoden is. Um, I know it doesn't get as much play as Suikoden 2, but it it sets the baseline for that series so so well and has such great character work and the combat is so quick. Um, and it has things to improve upon, but it's, yeah, it's a phenomenal. Yeah, it's a hell of a starting RPG. point for that series. Like, it's like yeah. a pocket-sized, but also just really dense and really good. Yep, and this has the greatest mm. time travel game of all time this year, isn't it? It does, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Tales of Fantasia. <laughs> Mm-hmm. So I mean, good. Tales of Fantasia yep, is a good one, actually. <laughs> it is. I'm not making fun of it, but uh, yeah. It's, Tales of Fantasia and Chrono Trigger are kind of like uh, the year that Deep Impact and Armageddon came out at the same year. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, they play very differently as well. And actually, I didn't bring up Fantasy Star Online for being like the first console RPG, but like, a console on MMO. But Tales of Fantasia is a really interesting piece of kit because it was one of the, it was the first Super Nintendo. They had the reason it didn't come over to the West is because they had to basically have a whole new cartridge for it to fit in sound chips and stuff to include voice acting in it. That was like the main reason it didn't make its way over here. So it's like a technical feat as well on top of being a pretty solid RPG in its own right. Very true. And it has the, one of the most infamous fan translations ever. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the, let's the, not the, say that line. The D, no, we're not going to say that line. The D-E-J-A-P uh, translation of Tales of Fantasia takes some liberties, um, but was it, it was my first exposure to playing that game, and it, it really blew my mind. It was uh, I, I, I played Tales of Fantasia in probably 01 or 02, and then after that I sought out Tales of Destiny and Tales of Eternia, one of which I liked much more than the other. <laughs> but I, I've, um, Tales of Fantasia has... A, a, a sort of normal RPG story, but combining that, w- which is a pretty good story, I think, with a really interesting action combat system, the likes of which I had never played before, with, uh, I mean, some of the more colorful <laughs> bit, um, character moments, hmm. it made me into a lifelong Tales fan. Like, like every single Tales game I've ever played, I'm trying to scratch that itch of how much I like Tales of Fantasia, and maybe, maybe only Abyss and Vesperia have really succeeded, but I, uh, I, I don't. I don't know. And also, that's one of the first anime games I really played because I, I played it before. I tried Lunar One or Two, and it has it has a voiced J-pop opening song, and Kless is voiced by Trunks from Dragon Ball. He is. Yeah, it's great. It's so cool. Oh, it's so good. And um, Dragon Quest Six, not my favorite Dragon Quest game, but a very, very good one. Uh, we, uh, it was finally re- um, released in the West for, with its uh, DS version over a decade later. Which is all, which is also a very good uh, DS um, version. This is the rarity where I think the OG one is actually slightly better, just mm. because the graphics are very Chrono Trigger. Um, I like the graphical presentation a lot. More. Maybe, but does it have uh, does it have the party chat with a dragon that's in love with a human? It does not have the party chat, mm. but. That is something. That's accurate. That is something indeed. Yeah. What? It's very cute. Um, (laughs) Yeah. Dragon Quest. Dragon Quest Six is good. Great. Not not my favorite Dragon Quest, but but I'm a big Dragon Quest fanboy, so I I like almost all of them. And uh, so, Jono, how much time do we have to talk about Romancing Saga Three? I think (laughs) I can't remember. I think it's one of my first random episodes I ever did, and I just take a hammer to it repeatedly. Uh, but here's the thing about Romancing Saga 3. I hate it, but at the same time, I look at it and I can appreciate what it is because it is one of the best-looking RPGs on the system. It has an astoundingly beautiful soundtrack. Mm. Um, it's it's very... It's it's late Squaresoft uh, SNES. It's, it's hard to beat that in terms of its presentation. Um, I don't like it, but I understand why people do. And that's the nicest thing I'm ever going to say about Romancing Saga 3 ever again. (laughs) Clip it. Clip it, someone. (laughs) I see why people like it. Put that on the box. (laughs) Um, A much better game, though, I think, is Lufia 2. Yeah, Lufia 2 is great. I was not on those podcasts, but it was not for lack of interest. I was just really busy. I forget. I think it was spring 2009, maybe maybe February 2000. Excuse me, 2019. 2019. March 2019. March 2019. Okay, it was early 2019. I remember. I remember it was the springtime, but uh, 
but I, I couldn't be on those episodes for reasons I don't remember. But that, uh, that, that game is a little bit late era Super Nintendo, but it just does so many brilliant things with puzzles and dungeons that, uh, and it has a monster recruiting system and, um, uh, it, it, it feels so content rich for being a Super Nintendo game. Oh, it also has a roguelike esque, uh, um, optional dungeon that you can play th- um, throughout the game. Uh, it's really, really excellent and has a love story that made, that literally brought tears to my eyes during the end credits. Yeah. I thought you weren't going to talk about the ending, and I was like, well, no, 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 well, well, I, I won't, um, I won't do a spoiler, but, but yeah. like, it's the first time I, <laughs> yeah, I played that game, uh, not on the original SNES. I played it in, I think, the early 2000s, around the same time I played Tales of Fantasia. But it, um, the ending brought, it's the first time I remember crying in a video game. Yeah, it, it's, it's a great game. I mean, I was on those episodes, um, and I love the way, and we didn't, you didn't talk too much about combat, but the combat has just enough, along with everything else you talked about, which is also amazing. Just enough customization that makes it feel unique. Um, it feels like simplistic turn-based combat, almost like made perfect. Yeah, and, yeah. and there's there's um, character-based customization and um, equipment-based customization, and that monster recruiting system that I mentioned, where you get sort of a fifth party member is the is one of the monsters that you've met. Um, it, it's a game that feels way ahead of its time uh, for coming out in 1995 because it, it's a uh, like like that that uh, equipment based skill learning is a Final Fantasy IX thing in ni- in the year two thousand, and uh, the monster recruiting stuff is a, a little bit Dragon Quest V, but also like a a little bit late SMT, um, late nineties Pokemon. It 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 feels really ahead of its time, and it has a great story and characters. Luffy Two is special. Yeah, I think it's another one of those perfect sequels. Um, I guess it's a prequel technically. Mm-hmm. Um, I just love the like I really really like Luffy, but for me. The brilliance of Lufia 2 is they just took the best part of Lufia 1 and just made it into a full-fledged game. The opening yeah. of Lufia and 1 is it genius. all the worst parts of Lufia I don't, 1. <laughs> I, uh, I mean, it, for the 2000 entry, uh, we were ta- uh, Jono, you mentioned about um, sequels that had you never feel like you had to play the previous game. That's what Lufia 2 is to me. I think it's the only yeah. good Lufia game, <laughs> but, <laughs> it's, uh, but, at, but, but at least it's excellent. You could play like the first hour of Lufia One, and that would be like the best part of Lufia One. Not coincidentally, <laughs> you can play the first 50. the first hour of Lufia One is yeah. Lufia. You can play the first fifteen minutes of <laughs> Lufia One. Although I have to giving Lufia One its its uh, its due, that was a brilliant conceit. Opening the game with the oh, end know. of the other. That's cool. Yeah, then yeah. you put and the it, twist in that game was awesome. Yeah, so too. like 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 you play as legendary heroes for the first hour of that game, and then it's one or two generations later you're playing. Uh, uh, it, sort of like dealing with the the aftermath of what happened at the beginning. It's it's it, Lufia One is not terrible, but I don't I don't think I would I would rather replay Lufia Two than try to play that through to the end. Um, Any day, that would be my advice. Right, but uh, before we move on to our uh, to our overall winner, which may, listeners maybe you've guessed it already, maybe you haven't. Uh, I want to shout out Terra Enigma a little bit. What a weird, cool game about yeah. about rebuilding re- reviving the world rebuilding the world rebuilding civilization and then getting into some real weird kill god nonsense at the end uh th- that game is not like anything else i've ever played um and it's it's in that uh what would you call it the uh the the heaven and earth trilogy um it's that games yeah yeah the uh, um soul blazer illusion of gaia slash illusion of time and then terra enigma it's i i think it is the most experimental out of a very experimental trio and really, really holds up. It's a, it's, um, I, I sort of think the early game dungeons are better than the late game dungeons, but it's, uh, um, like chapter two is my favorite part of this four chapter game that gets real weird in chapters three and four, but it's, um, really excellent. And, uh, we did some episodes on it back in the three episodes per month, um, game journal days of retro encounter. So, uh, go ahead and listen to those. I, th- I think, Oh man, I think some, I think like half of the guys on those podcasts are no longer with the site, but, um, they were so long ago. But, uh, Terra Enigma is really cool. Secret of Evermore, you got a dog. It's a good dog. Yeah. yeah. I'm a little bit Close surprised that you haven't talked more about Second Tensetsu 3, actually. Oh, well, I've talked about Second Tensetsu yeah, 3 over three episodes in 2020 and 2019. <laughs> Just download um, those. I, and, I, and, and not coincidentally, I've played through Second Tensetsu 3 t- three times in 2019 and three times in 2020. I'm about Second Tensetsu 3'd out. Uh, there, there were new game pluses in 2020, so it went way faster. Uh, but <laughs> it's one of my all-time favorite su- uh, Super Nintendo RPGs. The remake's great. Uh, listen to those episodes. And uh, I guess looking at the games on the 1995 list we haven't mentioned, uh, we kind of glossed over one of the best RPGs of all time. 
right? Front <laughs> mission. <laughs> Whoops. Chrono Trigger's good, turns out. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think I, this is what pushed it into my... It just got into my top five. Without Chrono Trigger, I'm not even sure it'd have been on the list. I don't think for me. Like as much as I love, well, I, agree, I sure. love Psycho Densetsu Three. I'm sure everybody knows that. Having listened to the podcast, I love Tales of Fantasia. I love Suikoden. I really like Terra Enigma. But Chrono Trigger for me is like pretty perfect. And um, yeah, it's just a phenomenal video game. It's again, it's breezy. It's easy to play. It's accessible. It's really well written. The characters are all great. The skills, every I, I don't know. I don't. I, it's like. I don't really have anything bad to say about it, basically. So. I, I agree. I, I mean, it's the best of Final Fantasy and Dragon Quest shoved into one game. I mean, that was the dream team, right? It was the dream yep, team. Yeah, the, the writer of Dragon Quest, the artist of Dragon Quest, and the creator of Final Fantasy, working with uh, a square team that was basically at the peak of their powers in 1995. It's a, it's a brilliant game. And I mean, I, I think, again, it's if no other RPGs got released that year, it was just Chrono Trigger, this year would probably still be appearing on this top 10 list just based on the strength of Chrono Trigger. It, probably. It finished second overall. Yeah. I, I mean, I voted it third, and without Chrono Trigger, it doesn't finish at all. So, yeah. I, it I finished second overall on my list, and it's because it's three games I adore, which include my, my favorite RPG of all time, and then another four or five that I really, really like. And that was enough for it to finish in my top two. Yeah, that's the same for me. It's the reason why it got to top one for me. There's just so many games here that are uh, my favorites and that are some of the best games ever created. All right. Now, let's move on to our number one overall year. And uh, we should say first that the second most recent year on our list is 2012, which finished eighth about uh, over an hour ago in podcast in podcast years. And um, the number one overall finisher is the most recent year. Maybe recency bias takes uh, effect a little bit here, but I think it's undeniable how good several of these games are. Um, and it finished in the top three for all four of us. So uh, we are mostly in agreement that this game is one of that this year is one of the all time great years. Oh, what do you mean mostly in agreement? It, we are all in agreement that this is one of the best all time years for RPGs. And it finished first place. The year is 2017. And again, this might be it might be helpful to remind uh, listeners these are by Japanese release date. So some of the great games that came out in 2017: Danganronpa V3: Killing Harmony, Dragon Quest XI: Echoes of an Elusive Age, Doki Doki Literature Club, Final Fantasy XIV: Stormblood, Fire Emblem Echoes: Shadows of Valentia, Horizon Zero Dawn, The Legend of Heroes: Trails of Cold Steel III. The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild, Nier Automata, Neo, and Xenoblade Chronicles 2. Now, I'll, I'll let someone else kick off most of the discussion, but for me, this was three games I love and a bunch of games I like, but those big three are Dragon Quest XI, Nier Automata, and Breath of the Wild. Mm. Like, yeah. holy crap, like three of my probably five or six favorite games of the 2010s all were in the same year. Yeah, and I realized I misspoke, actually, because I was saying, like, Undertale and Xenoblade 1 were, like, my two favorite games of the decade, and then I'm like, oh, Nier Automata, here we go. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, I think Nier Automata <laughs> alone probably carries the year for me. Like, there's a few other games, like Horizon Zero Dawn I'm not as hot on. Stormblood is probably the weakest 14 expansion, from what I know. V3 is probably my least favorite Danganronpa game. Xenoblade 2 is probably my least favorite Xenoblade game. But those three games of Dragon Quest XI, Nier Automata, and Breath of the Wild, like, Dragon Quest XI is, like, pure classic goodness. It's three acts of 100 hours that don't feel like 100 hours, that perfect classic turn-based RPG formulas. Breath of the Wild is controversial in some circles, but, like, you can't deny that the art direction, the kind of music direction and what it does with open spaces is pretty incredible and it changes Zelda potentially for the better, maybe controversially. Um, but Nier Automata is maybe one of the best written stories in an RPG I've played ever. Like, it's ridiculous. It, it just hits me, de yeah. knocks me on my feet every time I think about it. I reviewed it back when it came out, and I think I undersold it massively. It might be the game I undersold the most. And You gave it I a 92, did, didn't I, you? You know, I really read it, and I was like, mm, 2017 me was an idiot. Like, yeah. I... I mean, I also reviewed it, and I think gave it a 97, I think, maybe. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, yeah, I liked it a lot. it's just so special, and I think it, 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 it subverts so much in 
people still talk about it today. And I think, like these three games are like three games that people still talk about today. And you know, Xenoblade Two, a lot of people also really love. Neo was quite a surprise to a lot of people, I think. And Fire Emblem Echoes felt like a good return to classic Fire Emblem, especially after Fates. You know, because Fates is a controversial. Yeah, I, I, I've only played a little bit of Echoes, and as a longtime Fire Emblem fan, I I, I got real mad about Fates. But uh, but <laughs> e- e- Echoes is a good Fire Emblem game. Uh, Danganronpa V3s again, not my favorite either. That's Danganronpa Two, but it's a good mm-hmm. Danganronpa game. Oh, with, brilliant! Yeah, stuff, with, yeah. With, with 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 some end game stuff that was a real mind blow. <laughs> yeah. Holy smoke! Um, listen to that spoiler cast because uh, which I think is on Random Encounter or not Retro Encounter because oh boy that you have to go into spoilers to talk about why that game's great. But uh, oh, and uh, Caitlin's furious at me for uh, not having played Trails of Cold Steel three or Horizon Zero Dawn, two of her favorite games <laughs> of the past several years. But I, I, Cold Steel three is good, yeah. But um, I, and I, but Alana hit the head on it. Um, I, I think that this, um, the reason that I picked this year third and it ranks so highly for each of us is because those three are incredibly good. I think Nier Automata plays with some science fiction tropes that are not played out, but are well explored. Like, um, like, like the humanity of, uh, of, of artificial intelligence and what makes us human versus what makes us a machine and, uh, and sort of like the hopelessness of war. There's a lot of, there's a lot of ideas in place that are maybe familiar to readers of science fiction, but it does gameplay subversions of those science fiction ideas and and gameplay subversions of what we expect out of RPGs that that is truly incredible that takes the game to unbelievable heights that i uh that like i knew a little bit about it when i played it cuz i played it for the first time earlier this year but it it um it's still um completely floored me with some of the places it went near automata is one of the best games of the whole 2020 uh, 2010s i think when we, everyone was making their favorite lists favorites of the 2010s lists um in say december 2019 i unfairly excluded near automata which would have finished in my top 3 probably if i were to remake su- such a list yeah. so i apologize uh to the best of the decade rpg fan feature for me maybe holding <laughs> an automata back a little bit <laughs> you should <laughs> but <laughs> i made some mistakes too on that don't yeah. worry i regret m- many m- things m- m- mistakes were made one of them was not not voting for Nier Automata. Uh, mistakes were made, <laughs> um, but uh, Nier Automata is unbelievable. Uh, Dragon Quest XI is making me waver in my long held belief that Dragon Quest V is the is the best Dragon Quest game. Um, it, like I I think it's my favorite or second favorite now, but it, it just hit every single note I wanted it to hit as a long time Dragon Quest fan, and then uh, just gave you so many brilliant traditional RPG elements and open world elements. Uh, like it has the best crafting in a Dragon Quest game. It's the most beautiful looking Dragon Quest game. It, uh, it, it, it um, references Dragon Quest three in a way that it feels like the perfect meeting of retro and modern of Dragon Quest that uh, like w- when it came out and also made me um, feel like a Zelda game sometimes. Cause there's a lot of riding on your horse in a big, beautiful open field. Mm. Yeah, it's like the year where there's something for everybody, really. There is. And, you know, Stormblood may be the weakest FF14 story, but I think it has some of the best FF14 encounters. Right, like, like, yeah. like It's got some really cool raids and dungeons in yeah, it, yeah. The Four Lords Trials yeah. and the Ivalice raids written by Matsuno oh, yeah. um, uh, are so good. The Omega raid's great, too. Yeah, Omega, Omega raid is uh, is very good. I, I think I like Ivalice and Four Lords better. But like, um, yeah. And uh, it introduced us to... Uh, 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 some truly despicable FF14 villains <laughs> mm-hmm. that are uh, whose effects are still being felt in the game in 2020. Uh, like, like it, it uh, it's not my favorite bit of FF14, but it was very important to me on my FF14 journey. Like, I'm not kidding. But like, like if I were to rank my favorite bits of FF14 content, Four Lords is top five, and Evilise might be top one. Um, Jeez. And yeah, apologies to Caitlin. I haven't played Zero Dawn or Cold Steel Three, and that's maybe why I put it third on my list and not first or second. I mean, for me personally, this was like the easiest vote. I put it number one without any hesitation. As soon as I looked at the list, I was like, oh, that's easy. Especially because Dragon <laughs> Quest Eleven is on this list, um, which was not true if you're looking at North American release dates. Correct, yep. Um, and I, obviously, Nier Automata is one of my top two games of all time. I mean, like three of my top four games of the decade when we voted are on this list. Um, but I'm going to call out Xenoblade Chronicles 2, which you guys haven't talked about yet. And I know that I think I'm alone and like... Not alone, but I'm unique in that I prefer it to any of the Xenoblade games. 
It finished second on my best of the decade list. Oh, interesting. Um, and I, I adore the game, and I think it's because I like the music better here, and yeah. the combat. I for me, this has the best combat in any RPG ever yeah. made. That's um, good. it's just astoundingly amazing. And I, I, granted, I poured 300 hours into this game. So like, I, I dove into the depths of the combat and like in the first maybe 40, 50 hours of this game, the combat is obtuse and annoying. And even at the end, it's still obtuse. <laughs> um, but I, I just got addicted to it. I like the story a lot more than most people do. Um, I like the variety of it. And if you include Torna as part of Xenoblade Chronicles yeah. 2, um, hmm. it's the best DLC ever released that I've played. Um, and I messed around with both of the Witcher ones as well. Um, in that it is, it feels like Xenoblade Chronicles 2, but it also moves in a different direction. Um, and it's important in that way because like, I don't know, I played Remind Kingdom Hearts 3's <laughs> DLC, <laughs> which is one of the biggest pieces of trash I've had to experience in some time. Um, and I'm like comparing, like it's the same price as Torna. I'm like, what? How is this possible? Right. Yeah. Um, so anyway, like, and the Breath of the Wild I don't even love, but like it's such an important game. And Stormblood has great trials. And I'm going to stop talking now because Nier Automata is amazing. <laughs> I, 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 I kind of do love Breath of the Wild. It's one of my favorite Zelda games. Um, okay. But it, it, it's – I think it's the Zelda game that delivers the most on the promise of true nonlinearity since Zelda 1. Uh, yeah. Like, because um, in both Zelda One and Breath of the Wild, uh, after some very brief setup, uh, uh, Breath of the Wild is a little bit more than it's dangerous to go alone. Take this, but uh, like, like they just sort of drop you into the middle of a field with some items and some direction, and then you go nuts for the rest of the game. And like being that kind of story, while being this beautiful and giving players this much freedom, and uh, like, it's one of the best games ever for emergent stories. Like, uh, just the weird stuff that happens to you based on the combination of setting items and freedom and potential. Like, like it's, it's like every moment in Breath of the Wild is a great Zelda game and also kind of a great, you know, Far Cry game where you can accidentally set forests on fire and then get chased by tigers out of the area. I would say that others, I love the Zelda series. I mean, some of my favorite games are Zelda games. What sets Breath of the Wild apart for me is Zelda games are fun. They're experiences. They're, they're stories. Uh, Breath of the Wild is much more of an experience where it sets you into this world and lets you just do whatever the hell you want. You don't even have to go to the castle. You don't have to go to the, you don't have to go to anything in order. It's just, you're just living in this world. And that's yeah. unique. If, if two excited Zelda fans were talking to each other about Breath of the Wild, about Zelda games, which we did for a whole month in April 2018, uh, Retro Encounter Zelda Month, go and check it out on uh, RPGFan.com. But like, like if, if two Zelda fans were talking about any Zelda game besides Breath of the Wild, they would be like, oh, I loved this dungeon, oh, I loved this item, oh, I loved the story moment. But if, if, you're, if they were talking, having the same conversation about Breath of the Wild, it would be, this crazy thing happened to me. This crazy yeah. thing happened to mm -hmm. me. It's uh, the, the potential for what can happen in Breath of the Wild while still having a good Zelda story is so wild, forgive me for using the same adjective a lot, is uh, so impressive to me. And on and um, like I, I sort of would like Zelda to coexist in a world where they're still making handheld Zeldas and Breath of the Wild Zeldas and uh, Zeldas that are sort of more tradition go to these uh, ten dungeons and get these ten items. Like I, I sort of wish that Zelda al continues to make all of those things because there's different parts of the Zelda experience I value in different Vel Zelda games. But Breath of the Wild is 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 so good at for what it um, for what it accomplishes, and it's uh, it's also just like I mean, in no other game other than maybe Shadow of the Colossus do I just love standing in a quiet place and looking at the beautiful emptiness around me. It, it, the sound does so much for that game. Like sometimes when the music just stops, it's so good. And I think like I'm all I'm one of these people who really likes to be surprised. And like I'm I'm not a big Zelda fan at all. Like I definitely prefer the 2D games. And even then, there's only like four or five that I do really love. And even then, one of them is Minish Cap, which is apparently not that popular. Minish Cap um, is awesome, but. Minish Cap, Minish Cap is amazing. Min Minish Cap is it. Minish Cap is very very good. It's not yeah. one of my favorites, but it's real good. Mm. Yeah, um, and I don't really love open world games. Like, I'm not a big fan of things like Skyrim and things like that. And it, and like, you know, there's stupid things like, oh, it's raining and you can't climb up the cliff, and oh, your weapons break all the time, and things like that. But it puts all of this together in 
I still came out of having put like a hundred hours into it and loved it. And like Nia does a similar thing. And like you said, sci-fi. I don't like using sci-fi to describe Nia because I think it's so much more than that. But like, there's a lot of things about Nia Automata that I I was really worried about, and I just came away from it and was like, oh my god, it just all came together like so perfectly. Mm. I, I here's something that might be. I mean, who knows, in a year from now or two years or four years from now, depending on when it comes out. Uh, I feel like Breath of the Wild 2, we might be looking at it as it has the potential to be one of those perfect sequels we were talking about. If they if they take Breath of the Wild and they expand on it and they give us everything we love about Breath of the Wild, but maybe even add a little bit of uh, more traditional Zelda into it, I think that it might even eclipse Breath of the Wild. That's my hope anyway. I, I I mean I, I think Nintendo knows that they had an absolute um, like solid gold game with Breath of the Wild, so I'm just interested in in uh, what directions they take it by layering off of a foundation that's so strong. Yeah. Like like um uh, uh I'm, tr- I'm trying to think of how to of how to go with this like like uh, Majora's Mask took its foundation and went a really weird direction. That that yeah. in, instead of making another Ocarina of Time, if they do that for Breath of the Wild two or whatever subtitle the game gets, I, I will be so fascinated. Mm-hmm. I'm uh, it, of course people are excited for it because it's another big budget Zelda game, but because of what Breath of the Wild was and Nintendo knowing they could take a different direction with it makes me really fascinated. Yeah, well, yeah. fingers crossed. I... <laughs> and I mean, Definitely. geez, we we, uh, we didn't talk about. Doki Doki Literature Club. I mean, people. <sighs> the game scared me more went, than anything than when the dogs jumped out of the windows in Resident Evil. I oh, haven't played it. Upsetting. I haven't played it, but I listened to a podcast all about it, and every new plot point they went over, my jaw dropped another centimeter. It, like yeah, the places that games go, that game goes sounds insane. I have never <laughs> noped out of the game as fast as the end of the first part of that game. I was playing it, and then something happens, and I was just like, nope, 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 closing, goodbye, not playing for night now. I think um, if we were to do an episode on Doki Doki Literature Club, and I'm not saying we will, I could just invite Marcos Gaspar on and just say, uh, hey, this is Marcos Gaspar, what are your thoughts? And then I could just turn the mics off after two (laughs) hours. (laughs) He would do that. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And uh, I was doing some background Googling. There was was at least one 2017 game that we neglected to mention. Uh, Jono, isn't Yakuza Kiwami 2 one of the better Yakuza games? In my opinion, it's very good, yes. Um... It's, it's again one of the it's a remake that takes don't bother playing Yakuza 2 just play Kiwami 2 it's it takes everything from the original and makes it better um, it is missing a little bit of content from the original it's missing an entire uh, little area but you as, as I understand it you don't really miss it um, I love it it's a great game it uses the same engine as uh, as uh, Six. Yakuza 6 and Judgment yeah. and uh, supposedly uh, like a dragon will use um, it it builds on a lot of plot points that were found in Yakuza 0, which we were talking about is just an astoundingly great game. Mm-hmm. Um, so, let's see, I highly recommend you play it when you get yourself a little bit of time. I think you'd really like it. Um, it's certainly more complex in terms of the story than uh, Kiwame 1. Um, obviously, it's a sequel. But, yeah. Uh, yeah, I love it. It's not. I would never classify y- uh, Yakuza Kiwame as one of the best games of 2017, but I, I very much enjoy it. Yeah, I I just I was doing some like uh, not just for this, but throughout the whole podcast, I was going through each year to see if there was um, items that we missed, mm-hmm. and I and I added a couple like uh, while we were recording, but I that just happened with Yakuza Kiwami too, and I figured oh I should give Jono a shot to Aww. talk about one of the better Yakuza games He's very before happy. we before we close the book on 2017. No, it makes me very happy. I wish I had a chance to talk about Yakuza Five, but that's okay. Mm, oh, did that? That didn't come out in one of our years. I'm afraid. No, that, it did is that not. The issue here. No, it did not come out in one of our years. Tragically. Yeah, oh, and well. there's uh, so many like people can justifiably get upset for us not including their favorite games or favorite years. Like uh, 1996 was not one of our years, and that's when Super Mario RPG came out. And I'm sure that people are upset that uh, one of the best Super Nintendo RPGs didn't get any mention. Um, Persona 5 was 2016, even though it was 2017 in the West, so that's why that one slipped through the cracks. Uh, and uh, Final Fantasy X was a 2001 game, and that, uh, which is, again, not on our list. So there's like there are good RPGs that come out every single year. Uh, and it's really it was a really difficult exercise to go through... 33 lists of RPGs and pick 10 fav- uh, favorites out of those lists. And 
we mo- again, we mostly arrived to a consensus. There were six years that were on everyone's list, and we between all four of us, we only um, we only brought up fifteen years. But th- there's great RPGs every year, and I encourage you to check out the feature that uh, is going to be published throughout October in multiple parts to um, to just decide to uh, see how both the fans and the staff voted on what our favorite RPGs year to year were. And um, we discussed, uh, let's see, 14 years and probably 100 games in this podcast. So uh, hopefully we covered enough ground to entertain you, listeners. And thank you for listening to us for so long. And also thank you to uh, Zach, Jono, and Alana for joining me on this uh, on this podcast exercise, which I, I was worried it would go a little long, but ho- hopefully, I mean... Hopefully you uh, you guys aren't, aren't suffering right now, and honestly, I could talk to the three of you about RPGs for far longer than two hours. Aww. And hopefully we will on future podcasts. Yes. Yeah, you're all, all are welcome uh, among RPG fan staff to join Retro Encounter. You know where to find me. Uh, we can <laughs> the, the, so the subject can be literally anything. <laughs> but uh, for the next couple of weeks, we have picked literally a few things. Um, for the next... Two weeks, we're doing episodes on final, um, yeah, whoa, wrong, wrong fantasy. Fantasy Star 4, the end of the millennium, the, uh, one of the most beloved Genesis RPGs. Um, I'm pretty early on, but hopefully I'll be ready enough to talk about it, uh, for next week and the following week. Um, and a lot of the, pr- pretty soon I will have beaten two Sega Genesis games. How crazy is that? I'm so proud of you. <laughs> and the first, uh, the, the first one was Golden Axe on a sleepover probably 25 years ago. I'm still proud of you. Golden Axe is amazing. Yeah, it's good. We even we even played the multiplayer in Golden Axe, which is considerably less less so amazing. Good. No, no, I'm, I'm sorry. No, the, the, no, no, no. The one v one multiplayer. We played some of that oh, too. Okay, that, that's that's what I meant. I'm sorry. I, I was I was being a little vague. But anyway, um, Golden Axe, great. Fi- Fantasy Star Four, very good early on. But um, I still need to play it a little bit more. The, amazing. Those episodes Such are filling out are filling out. Uh, part of the rest of October, but also in October, we're going to do an episode on Finding Parag- Paradise, that Ken Gao visual novel of sorts, that is the, um, that is his follow-up to A Bird Story, which is sort of an interquel, and To the Moon, which is a uh, an indie game that we talked about earlier in this episode. Ken Gao is one of those sort of, you know, at the level of a Toby Fox, sort of a, uh, like, a like a platonic ideal of an indie developer who... <laughs> Uh, who has something to say and tells it very uniquely and artfully in a way that is really breathtaking. Um, I'm not saying Finding Paradise is is Undertale or even To the Moon, but I'm really excited to play that, especially since we did an episode on Bird Story a couple years ago, and I, I when I thought that game was great. You did one on To the Moon, too, yeah. Yeah, um, so uh, playing uh, Finding Paradise, which I haven't started yet, like, based on the promise of a Bird Story and To the Moon, I'm really interested to check that out. And you can see that later this month. Also, we do have um, a game chosen for two episodes in November. That is going to be Final Fantasy X-2, a game that I tried playing like 15 years ago, thought it had pretty menus, and then forgot about it forever. Uh, um, but I'm going to make a full faith effort to play it next month. And you can hear about it on two episodes of Retro Encounter. Speaking of Retro Encounter, the podcast you're listening to right now, if you want to reach out to Retro Encounter, the best way to do so is email retro at rpgfan.com with any of your complaints or queries or comments. You can also visit rpgfan.com's main website, recently renovated for 2020. Comment on the message boards, visit the Facebook page, Instagram, Twitter, Discord, Twitch. All of them are called either rpgfan or rpgfan.com. There are so many ways to interact with us. Please do do so however you choose, including three other podcasts, Random Encounter, which is about randomness and ho- and uh, hosted every two weeks, in part by you, Jono. Yes, come on by. We'd love to have you. Also, Rhythm Encounter, hosted by Mike Sal- uh, Salbato, <laughs> also every two weeks, and I think featuring all three of us on various episodes. So uh, if you want to hear the musical side of RPGs, we have a podcast all about it, which was active from for- 2014 to 2017, then took a long break, and then restarted less than two months ago. So please listen to Rhythm Encounter as well. Also, there is Phoenix Edge, which is hosted by Hat and uh, mostly focused on current events and is a weekly podcast that uh, that records, I believe, live every Monday or Tuesday and then uh, posts on YouTube and their own podcast feed, uh, usually a day or two later. They do really great work. Listen to Phoenix Edge, Random Encounter, Rhythm Encounter, and Retro Encounter. Uh, 
But before we sign off for good, uh, let's tell the listeners how they can reach each of us individually, starting with you, Zach. Uh, you can email me at ZachW at RPGFan.com, or you can find me on Discord at ZachW. And Jono. Uh, you can uh, email me at JLogan at RPGFan.com, or find me at Jono Logan on Twitter. And Alana. Uh, you can email me at Alana H at RPGFan.com. I am Alana on the RPG Fan Discord server. Um, my Twitter, which is probably the best place to find me, I am at Alana Hague. And listeners, if you want to reach out to me individually, the best way to do so is probably Twitter. I am at Evoker for Dogs, sometimes at The Real Monsoon most of the time. I am also Monsoon Mike on RPG Fans Discord, where I mostly get sports mad. <sighs> I. This was a good one. I, it was such a weird exercise to go through RPGs by year or release period instead of instead of game to game. But, uh, yeah. you know, I had a good time. Thanks for joining me. Yeah, Our pleasure. Thanks for having us. Listeners, thank you. Good night. And good luck. <laughs>